to represent in different ways. Um, and so, you know, I've tried some other things actually. And current now is, um, it's the work that I've done so far, which is not a large portion of my time there, is um, centered on uh, making circuits that are capable, to match disket capabilities, and to be able to convert. And so writing this efficiently is, is rather difficult because people, this was written in Python and people took full advantage of all the, um, you know, the, the freedom you have there. And um, it's very flexible. The circuits are mutable. The data structures around the circuits are mutable. Users can define dates on the fly with very few constraints. You can shove anything into a list. So, you know, um, you can't make a lot of assumptions about data types and so forth. And, you know, and, you know, I may have to like scale back perfect compatibility. Um, so I wanted. There's a lot of emphasis on. Um, how am I doing on time? Four minutes. Four minutes. There's a lot of emphasis on um, um, efficiency right now and scaling up. That they're trying to do. So I want from the beginning to choose some data structures and algorithms, not to have everything over optimized to begin with, but of course. Uh, to not find that you have to rip something at a deep level out later because it wasn't the right choice. That, that never actually works completely, but it's, it's a good thing to try. Um, so one of the first things you have to do is decide how to represent gates, and Julia will often reach for the type system for things. So these gates would be like, a, these are parameterless gates, hx, I don't know if you can see right now. And um, this one carries a parameter, this a z rotation gate. Um, but you're going to end up dealing with a container of these, and um, that means you're going to have to pull them out at runtime and not what they are, and you're going to have runtime dispatch, which in, which in Julia in particular is very slow. So you have to avoid that. Um, um, I don't know. It would be nice if you know there was more discussion or more in the Julia community uh, for, for, for ways to deal with this. Um, I think it'll, it's something that will grow naturally. But, um, I made this locking ends uh, to particularly for this um, this re, uh, this problem. Um, it's a copy. There's other packages like this. A copy of base enums, and but I had to add a few things. One is um, creating instances of this enum after it's been defined, because you have to make a lot of them. You have to allow users to make them. And another is I'm, I added named blocks or ranges of integers, so they represent classes of circuit operations. And this is a very crude type system attempt to put some structure into this, um, but you know it's the best I can do um, at the beginning. Um, and then uh, you need to represent the circuit for a lot of the majority of actually difficult tasks you have to do by, uh, by a directly acyclic graph. And it turns out that the graphs, the main Julia graphs package is sufficient. I had to roll my own metadata because the metadata packages are not sufficient. Um, there's work to be done there. Um, and there was a lot of sort of um, more or less fundamental or kind of low level um, algorithms and things that were missing. And I was concerned about getting some shows, meeting showstoppers and having to do something else with graphs. But um, it, I think all of those are taken care of. I put some of these things in, a, in another package so they can go into graphs eventually. Um, and then I don't want to say, as I kind of ran out of time here, but. Um, the data is stored in destructive arrays format to, to avoid um, for efficiency. For instance, these kind of op codes, and you can look at these as op codes are all stored in a single typed array of, of a single type. And then, you know, if you're careful, you can have a um, some this gate macro some uh, zero cost abstractions to allow you to think of the gates grouped together with the data they need, which is the standard way to do it. And um, I did. One benchmark here with a particular reduction of Selvin versus Gates and found that it's 20 to 30 times faster in CURT than our Python Rust um, implementation, which already has quite a bit of Rust in it. And it's also, you know, the code is quite a bit nicer. And then I'll just leave you, since I'm out of time, with a picture of, you know, this looks like a lot of the Python packages and so forth, except it has a nice Julia macro for building. Um, and yeah, I better switch there. So thanks.
since we are on to the next speaker, why don't we all save our questions that we definitely have for John. Um, thank him again for the great talk while Ash sets up. Uh, and our next speaker is Ashley Milstead talking about quantum optics touch L. Okay, well, while that warms up, which it seems to be doing right now, um, yeah, my name is Ashley Milsed. I uh, work at the AWS Center for Quantum Computing. And there it is, so that's, oh, the rest, okay. Ah, good, okay. Didn't have the same problems from before, so. I work at the AWS Center for Quantum Computing, uh, which is in Pasadena, California at Caltech. Um, it's um, at the same location, it's not part of Caltech. But it's nice being close by. Okay. Oh boy. Yeah, I think uh, my laptop has changed its mind. Okay, here we go. So um, I'm going to talk about, um, well, the title is Convenient Time Dependence in Quantum Optics.jl, but really this is kind of more of a, a bit of an, an advertisement for quantum optics as a package and also for the kind of stuff that we are interested in doing um, at the AWS CQC. Um, and some new features that we added to uh, that package recently. So this is a picture of our location in Pasadena. Looks a bit different around here. It's a little drier at the moment. Um, why do we use Julia at the Center for Quantum Computing? Well, it's mainly for doing like simulations related to developing quantum devices. So we want to understand how these devices work and how to optimize them and so on. And so we, we, we like to have good performance in these simulations, especially when the quantum systems get a bit larger. We like the composability of Julia because it enables us to move pretty fast with the development of these tools. Um, we like the community and the ecosystem. It's pretty easy to get assistance if uh, we do encounter an issue. Um, Julia Slack is a great place to be. <laughs> um, and uh, of course, the, the SciML ecosystem is pretty awesome and it's nice to be able to access that easily. Um, so quantumoptics.jl. What is it? It's, uh, it's a tool, uh, a very general tool, originally developed by uh, Helmut Rich, his group at the University of Innsbruck, Universität Innsbruck um, in Austria. And it's recently been sort of, you know, it's been around for a while now, but it's been growing and it's been attracting new users and contributors recently. Um, it's a general tool, as I mentioned. You can use it to describe and simulate pretty general quantum systems, both discrete and continuous. So that's like, discrete levels or continuous systems like light fields or uh, you know, uh, uh, oscillators um, and everything in between. It's got a convenient sort of blackboard, mathy syntax, or whiteboard if you prefer, mathy syntax. Um, you can use pretty much any operator representation or state representation you like because of the flexibility of like, multiple dispatch in Julia. So, dense, lazy uh, representations of operators, sparse matrices, of course. Um, it's kind of like Qtip, in case you're familiar with that, which is a Python package that has similar goals and aims, but it's, of course, a little more Julian. So it, uh, uh, it's a lot easier to, for example, make it fast than it was for Qtip, who had to jump through quite a few hoops to get good performance. Um, so to give you a, a feel for it, here's a very simple program. We use the package. We define a basis for our quantum system. Here, it's a combination of a FOC basis and a spin basis. We define some operators, a destruction or annihilation operator, a Pauli Z operator, or Z, um, a sigma plus and minus. These are just operators you can use to define your quantum system. Um, we define a composite system using a tensor product notation, and we can embed all those operators into this larger Hilbert space. Uh, to describe this composite system of now maybe a, a resonator and a two-level system, like an atom, something like this. And then we define the Hamiltonian H. We always use H, of course. So there's the Hamiltonian for the system. And it's very simple. It looks like what you'd write on a blackboard, more or less. Um, but of course, you can do efficient simulations with it. Uh, for example, you compute the eigenvalues um, of this Hamiltonian, which is often something we're interested in, find out what the energy gaps in the system are like. Um, now, uh, what I want to do today is talk about uh, convenient time dependence in these systems. So when we define a Hamiltonian, 
for a system that we control, that we're building ourselves and that we control somehow, we uh, often do that by introducing time-dependent terms in the Hamiltonian to do a dynamical simulation. So this might represent, say, a laser being shot at your system or, uh, or a microwave signal being sent in to your processor. Um, so that shows up as a time-dependent term in the Hamiltonian, and the new feature I wanted to talk about, it's something that Q-tip has actually had for a while, <laughs> but quantumoptics.jl hasn't, is a convenient way of representing and abstracting these time-dependent terms. So you can see here with H-drive, we are constructing um, a term with a time-dependent coefficient, which is just the cosine of time in this case. So we put in a function. It's the coefficient for the operator on the right, which is A1 dagger plus A1, or A1 adjoint plus A1. And um, we can compose that with the static Hamiltonian just by summing. Very simple, very intuitive. Uh, the result is a time-dependent sum also, uh, because this is sort of a lazy sum structure where you have terms and the coefficients can be functions or constants. That's just it's a very simple thing. Um, so the Hamiltonian uh, or any operator of this form looks like this. You have a sum over some coefficient c. These can be dependent on time and then you have some static operators inside. Now there's actually a general interface which allows you to have other types of time dependence, like if you had something more complicated, maybe this H is also element-wise time dependent or something like that. You can use the general interface to represent that too. Um, so you know what can you do with this? Once you have the Hamiltonian, you can just feed it to one of the standard time evolution functions, like the Schrodinger evolution function here. You create an initial state, you say, boom, from where, uh, from when, and to when you'd like to simulate, and you get some result. And um, just to prove that it kind of works in a screenshot, um, we have here an example of showing that the occupation number of the resonator mode here starts at zero and goes up to 1.26 something by the end of the evolution. And the entanglement entropy, everyone likes entanglement, right? Uh, starts at zero and goes up to some non-zero value. We've created entanglement. Isn't that amazing? But it's obviously only in simulation. Um, so just to summarize, these are um, neat little operators. You can construct them in a variety of convenient ways. Here's sort of a vector construction syntax. Um, you can compose them very simply to construct more complicated time-dependent systems. This is something that's actually really important for us because we like to be able to construct uh, models using general code um, for a variety of quantum devices, and if you want to like write general code to do that, it's really hard unless you have some way of like encapsulating the different time-dependent terms you want to put together in the end. And it's efficient. So, um, unsurprisingly, in Julia, we demand it has to be fast. So, if you uh, update the time value of these operators. You don't get any allocations. This means, like for small system simulations um, that we quite often do, where there's fast time dependence, so the integrator is calling the objective function many, many, many times for a simulation, thousands, hundreds of thousands of times perhaps, it's really important that we don't do anything slow, like do any runtime dispatch or allocate in this situation. So we make sure we don't do that. Um, so. That's not the only cool new thing that's come into quantum optics recently. Um, recently, um, uh, contributors split out uh, quantuminterface.jl, which is a common interface layer that other packages can use to provide um, you know, other functionality, but using the same general interface of bases and states and operators and so on. We've ha we have lazier, lazy operators than we had before, which is nice because lazy operators are nice ways of efficiently representing like, larger, more complicated systems. Um, and you can put them into some concrete form later. Usually that's the slow part, so you don't want to do it all the time. And uh, faster, dense, lazy tensor products. And if you don't know what that means, don't worry, but um, you know, that was something that was quite interesting for us early on. And we've integrated CryoKit and Fast uh, XPM recently uh, for uh, like, yeah, uh, solving eigenvalue problems and integration. Are we about done? Yeah. So contributions are welcome, of course. There are things to do. And with that, thank you very much.
All right. Um, so thank you again to Ash. Uh, I'm actually the next speaker, so I'm going to set up. In the meantime, I see there's some people standing in the back. If you'd prefer to stand, you're obviously welcome to, but there are some seats available if you'd like to sit. Um, so just while I get my laptop set up, uh, if you're interested in finding a seat, please feel free. Uh, especially like sort of in this row right here, there's like three or four seats. Oh, and my thing is showing up. So uh, that's great. Looking good. Um, so I am the last speaker before lunch. So I'm gonna ask Michael to be like really aggressive, controlling uh, us getting to go to lunch. Um, so also if I go over time, just please feel like free to start walking out. Um, <laughs> I will, I'll only cry a little bit. Uh, all right. Um, so uh, again, thanks everybody for attending the mini. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about one of the projects that I work on at work. Uh, just like Ash, I work for the AWS Quantum Computing Group, but not for the Center for Quantum Computing. Rather, I'm a scientist on the Amazon Bracket team, and I'm gonna be talking about our Julia SDK for Bracket today. Um, if you attended a Cajun meetup earlier in the winter of this year, uh, some of this will look familiar, um, but if not, I'll try and give an introduction to what Bracket is, why we're using Julia for it, um, and then how folks can get involved. Uh, so just like a quick intro to me. Um, so I've been a Julia contributor working on quantum stuff since January 2015. Um, occasionally have given talks about it at JuliaCon uh, and have been at Bracket since 2020, and before that um, was at Flatiron, so shout out to all the Flatiron folks here. Um, and I have uh, totally destroyed my brain with both quantum and Julia related content. Uh, so if there's anything that's unclear, please feel free to just stick up your hand in the middle of the talk and ask, um, and I will be happy to address your question. So as I mentioned, um, I work on Amazon Bracket, which is part of the overall quantum computing group, but distinct from the Center for Quantum Computing. So uh, to quickly give you the sort of two second introduction, Amazon Bracket is a cloud service available through AWS, Amazon Web Services, for accessing both quantum devices and then also simulating them. Um, so it's kind of a one-stop shop for a variety of quantum technologies you can use to both sort of um, simulate what your circuit might do on the device and then also actually run on the real hardware to understand how it's performing. Uh, so our pitch for folks uh, who are interested in using quantum technology, which as probably most of us know is still pretty embryonic, is that we let you build, test, run, and analyze so you can easily build circuits, um, test them with simulators, and then run them on real hardware, and then finally use a bunch of other technology available through AWS to analyze the results. Yay. Um, so during this talk, we're gonna be almost entirely focusing on the left column here, build, because we're talking about the SDK. But if you're interested in finding out more about the other aspects of this or want to go into more depth, I'm definitely happy to talk about it as a sidebar later on during either lunch or the BOF or something like that. So please feel free to reach out if that's interesting to you. Sort of whole services organized as part of AWS. So on the left here, we've got um, users queue public. So a bunch of happy uh, sort of cartoon users. They're working either through their, like, their managed Jupyter Pluto, note Pluto notebook, or maybe they're just running stuff on their laptop, probably like most of us do day to day, or maybe they're using the console on the AWS web page. They send some tasks. So like, I wanna run this circuit to the bracket service that's hosted in, on AWS. Let's say they run on a simulator or like a real device. Um, having done that, then maybe they go actually run on quantum hardware and the pipelining for that is handled by us. And then they're able to integrate with a bunch of other Amazon services, for example, so that they can monitor how their task is doing or make sure if they're trying to do a quantum um, algorithm run on data that's sensitive, that's handled appropriately, things like that. Um, but again, we're gonna be almost entirely focusing on the left side of this diagram because that's the part that we've written in Julia. Uh, uh, so again, just another quick pitch of we ha do have a bunch of different hardware technologies available that you're able to use through the SDK that is in Julia, as I've shown. Um, and in particular, I really wanna shout out to QERA here on the left, who are the analog Hamiltonian um, simulation device. They are a sponsor of JuliaCon, and they have a table downstairs in the main hall, and they also have a really great Julia package I'll be mentioning again, blockade.jl. 
Uh, so if you're interested in that, definitely talk to them and also to us. Um, this is kind of an area that we're working on together. So if you have any thoughts about what could be more useful or features we should support, please come talk to us. We also support now um, on Q's new trap down device, Aria. We have uh, Rigetti's Aspen M3 and OQC's Lucy. And there's always more devices coming to the service. So if you're interested in testing out these sort of new technologies, um, come check us out. And then we also have a bunch of uh, simulators that we allow folks to use. This is something that I work on more directly. We have simulators that run sort of locally, we would say. These are run like on your hardware that you control. So that would be like your laptop or if you have a cluster you're running. Or we have ones that are managed by us where all the compute happens behind the scenes in the cloud. Um, I'll just show the slide and you can read more about these on the documentation for the service if you're interested. Um, and we can think of a, when we're interacting with a service like this, there's kind of two levels to the SDK, as John sort of mentioned earlier when discussing Qiskit. There's kind of high level and low level components. Um, so higher level components might be something like a uh, convenient API to create circuits and apply noise to them and then say, I want to measure this kind of result. Like I want to measure an expectation value or I want to measure a state vector if I'm running in a simulator. And then we also might have higher level constructs like building an analog Hamiltonian simulation program or maybe if we really want to get fancy, building microwave pulse gates um, since we know better how we want to do that necessarily than the default option. And then other constructs would be, you know, when we run the circuit, we get results. Okay, I want to use error correction or error mitigation um, through some API for that, like if I want to use MIDIC. Um, and finally, there's things like querying the device, learning facts about it. So an example of that would be like, what's the topology of Rigetti's device? Like which gates are connected to which gates? Um, and what are the current fidelities that they're reporting for those gates? And also, uh, the especially very important on hardware is cost tracking. So if I want to run like 100 circuits of size whatever with this many shots, how much is that going to cost me? But then behind the scenes, there's kind of lower level components. So there's the raw results, so just literally the shot bit strings that are reported to like the mitigation software. There's the actual circuit IR or program IR that is sent to the service when it interacts with the device that the sort of convenient circuit builder then translates to when it submits things. Um, and then there's behind the scenes constructs for actually kind of controlling what the service does. So we can think of these convenience routines that allow us to like quickly build up circuits and then much lower level calls that let us do things like submit HTTP post requests to the actual devices um, and like check device statuses. So our goal uh, with the package I'm about to introduce, bracket.jl, was to have a Julia interface for both of these levels because some folks want to be able to write their own circuits with their own language and we don't necessarily want to be able to force everybody into kind of our dialect or our paradigm. So we have a complete rewrite of the bracket Python SDK and Julia, um, both sort of the high level components I just discussed and then also the lower level components that let you directly submit, um, for example, IR uh, in our specific IR language or open chasm to the device. So uh, our goal here is to allow people to use almost every aspect of the service that's available through the Python SDK without actually having to use Python if they don't want to. Um, so nearly every feature is available without needing to install any Python packages. Uh, the one situation this is not true in right now is if you want to use one of all Amazon's pre-written local simulators, those are currently only in Python. More on that at the end of this talk. Um, but everything else you can do in pure Julia, uh, both. You know, this allows us to avoid having to install either Python call, which is a wonderful package, or PyJulia. And it also frees us from kind of having to use the Python language for everything, like in, in the sense of sort of the Python architecture, the Python way of thinking about things. Um, Python's a great language, but we're at JuliaCon. We like Julia. Julia has its advantages as well. <coughs> Sorry. That Ash should discuss. Let me get some water here before I like start just dying up here, even more than I already am. And we want to offer the Julia Quantum community a first class experience to either build on what we've chosen as a paradigm for creating circuits, interacting with them, or building their own custom solutions uh, that fit what they want to do better. Okay, hopefully that's better. 
So we support uh, multiple computing paradigms that are available on the surface. Service. We'll talk about gate-based circuits first because this is probably uh, the one that most people are familiar with. So we support all the gates and noise operations that are available in Python. Uh, we have a large variety of gates and almost all sort of Markov noise that is available to run on our noise simulators. Uh, and you can attach all of the result types that are supported, like expectation values, variance, amplitude, all that good stuff. And we support running in an exact, um, you could say, shots equals zero or shots equals infinity, depending on the language you like. Of course, this is only in simulators. Or more probabilistic, so shots greater than zero, what the device actually does, um, kind of runtime paradigm. So that lets you, if you're running on a simulator, model what the device actually does. Or if you're running on the device, say, like, I want to run 100 shots or whatever. Um, and then our Julia SDK can retrieve these raw results and do the processing for you. So for example, it can figure out what the expectation value is if you ask for 100 shots. Um, and we're currently looking for uh, help, as I'll mention again at the end, at integrating with more sophisticated kind of post-processing, so things like error mitigation, error correction, um, observable estimation, things like that. Uh, and another thing that we're able to do, um, which of course the Python SDK is also able to do, is run uh, these sort of simulations concurrently, especially on the managed devices. And uh, as I mentioned, QERA is using Julia as well with their blockade package uh, that lets you build analog Hamiltonian simulations for their device. So in the interest of time, and also not to steal their thunder, I'm not gonna go in depth into, analo into how analog Hamiltonian simulation works. So stay tuned for Roger's talk later. Um, or if you want to know more about that, talk to him or John from QERA or go see the QERA sponsor table. Uh, also, if Pedro's here, um, yes, talk to Pedro. Um, so they're the analog Hamiltonian simulation experts. Um, but it allows us to program a device with controllable atom geometry in 2D, and we're able to control the waveform pulses that are used to actually run uh, simulations on these Rydberg systems. And we have an integration with blockade.jl that allows you to construct uh, these kind of simulations in their high performance simulator and then translate directly to running on the device from QERA that's available on the bracket service. So you can do the entire sort of setup um, and uh, analysis, testing, and running entirely in Julia, which is pretty cool to me. Um, and then finally, we are able to run so called dedicated jobs, um, which you can think of kind of as like end to end experiments. Um, so this is a feature we offer called hybrid jobs. Effectively, what it is is you have a Docker container and some script that you want to run. So an example of when you might want to do this would be, let's say you want to run QIOA on a like one of the devices we offer, or you want to compare how two different devices run the same QIOA algorithm. So with jobs, you can spin up a Docker container with whatever software you want, and then just point it at some quantum hardware. It gets priority access to the hardware while you're running. Um, and at the end, it'll report all of the training information. So if you want to like get some graphs to put in your paper or something like that, uh, it's able to do this for you. And again, this is entirely doable in Julia. Setting up a job like this that's all in Julia is a little complicated. So if anybody wants to see a demo of how to do this, I'm happy to show one. Uh, but again, in the interest of time, I don't want to take up too much time being like, check out my Docker file. Uh, but it's actually not as complicated as it might seem. And one thing that's really nice about this, especially for people who are more expert developers, is you can embed and use your own simulators or software. So for example, if you're a huge iTensor fan, we don't natively support iTensor, but that's fine. You can easily build it into a Julia Docker image and just run stuff and then compare it with what the actual device is doing. Um, so to kind of sum up, um, I want to just mention a couple opportunities for people who want to contribute, and also maybe discuss a few common areas of interest, both for us, like people coming from the quantum group at Amazon, but then the wider quantum community here. Uh, so before I do that, I'm going to take another sip of water. Cool. Uh, so as I mentioned, Cura has this really great package, blockade.jl, that allows you to simulate up to 50 atoms on their neutral atom device, and which is able to submit tasks to their QPU pretty seamlessly using bracket.jl. Um, so we have an ongoing integration with that software, but there's definitely a lot of opportunity for people to contribute more to that. Um, so if folks are interested, for example, in replicating ex like results that have been published on various analog Hamiltonian simulators 
using the software, that's definitely something we can work on supporting, especially if there's features that you need that are not currently present. Um, and we also currently have a plugin that exists the support yao.jl. So of course, probably everybody here who's vaguely familiar with Quantum knows about Roger's awesome yao package. Uh, so this is kind of, you might call it like um, the the Quantum Flux. Uh, it allows you to do all kinds of differential pro programming for quantum computing. And we now have an integration with it. So if you currently have like a, a script or a workflow that you've been running with Yao, you should now be able to run it on real hardware if that's something that interests you. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. Uh, this plugin was developed as part of Penny Lane's Q hack this year by some very enterprising students. So there's definitely a lot of opportunity to make that plugin perhaps like a, a more featured, uh, add tests to it, uh, add demos. Um, so again, if that's something that interests you, uh, come talk to us during the hackathon. Um, and the fact that we implemented sort of all levels of our SDK in Julia means that creating integrations with something like Zygote or, um, oh my gosh, uh, Enzyme or Flux uh, is really straightforward. And it means that you, for example, do not have to interact with Python objects if you don't want to. Um, and similarly, if you want to build your own circuit representation, as long as you can teach your circuit representation how to become OpenCASM 3, then you can use all of the features I've discussed about running stuff on real hardware, running it on simulators, um, without ever having to deal with the choices that we made about what we want circuits to look like. Um, and so for this reason, it's really easy to write like a plugin or connector for whatever quantum software you want to use um, and make that available as either a local simulator that somebody runs on their own hardware or as kind of a higher level framework on top of this. And our goal is to make things kind of purposely low level and then let people who have a specific application in mind build stuff on top of it. Um, and we want to enable people in Julia to have a first class experience when they do that. Uh, and so I should mention that we are looking for contributors. There's lots of opportunities for people to add things if they'd like. I think one of the big sort of low-hanging fruits is adding support for local simulators. For example, if there were a tensor network software you wanted to use to run MPS-based circuit simulations, um, it's pretty straightforward to add a sort of pass-through support for that. Um, adding integration with the Yao ecosystem, as I mentioned, um, and then higher level templates for algorithms like QAOA, VQE, QAA. Um, all of these, of course, obeying the iron law that any quantum algorithm has to have a Q in the name. Uh, I finally escaped Tensor Network World where every algorithm also has to be four letters long. Uh, so maybe someday we'll escape the Qs. Um, another area that would also be great to have uh, folks adding support for would be measurement approximation techniques. So by that I mean like classical shadows, poven based techniques, um, other very jargony things. Um, and then finally, one of the other areas that we currently don't have full featured support compared with Python is support for pulse control, uh, like creating waveforms, frames, things like that. So if that's something that interests you, uh, again, come talk to us, especially at the hackathon. And we have a readme with lots of open contribution ideas and issues if you want to find out more. Um, and we're also very excited when people submit feature requests or bug reports. So if you come look at the package and you're like, this sucks, I want you to support this, please just let us know. Um, and it's great to add stuff that people would actually like to use. And if you're not yet a quantum expert, that's fine. Um, there are options for you too. And by that I don't mean like, oh, if you don't have a PhD, you're not an expert. Uh, it's more like if you're sort of, we would say like interested in quantum, but you haven't been studying it for a while, you don't know that much about it, that definitely does not mean you don't have anything to contribute. Um, so please, uh, both if you have thoughts for our package, but in general at the Quantum Mini, uh, let us know if there's something you'd like to work on or if you don't know what to work on, but just want something to be uh, offered to you, come let us know. Uh, and then I would also be remiss if I didn't mention that we have credits available, uh, both for academic research and open source development. Um, so for academic researchers, including PhD students independent of your advisor, um, <laughs> you can acquire credits to run on any of the AWS services, including the quantum hardware. So if you want to do something like that, come talk to us. Um, Ash or I can help you out. We can hook you up with credits to be able to run on quantum hardware if you have a research idea that you want to implement. Um, or if you're a PI uh, and you want to do the same thing, again, just come talk to us. We can work with you on getting that set up. And we also have open source credits available for general open source development. That's handled by a different team, but uh, we're definitely 
available to connect you with them and hopefully advocate. Um, and then we also work with Unitary Fund to provide microgrants for open source contributors. So if you're not familiar with Unitary Fund, it's an organization that gives people these microgrants, like $500, $1,000, to implement a feature in a variety of quantum softwares. And we've also worked with them to do mentorship for, uh, for people who are sort of joining the quantum software developer community. So if that's something that you're interested in, again, please come talk to us. And then finally, uh, we have internships next summer for people who are PhD students. Um, so this summer, we're all full up because it's the middle of summer. But especially if you are a sort of senior in your graduation PhD student, you're interested in getting an internship in the quantum industry, uh, we do have opportunities opening up for next year. So come find any of us and we can give you some information about that. Or if you're a PI who has a student who might be interested, um, we're also available to talk to people in that situation. And so just to kind of sum up, uh, we're gonna be at the Saturday Hackathon and if you're interested in finding contribution opportunities in the wider quantum software world, we'd definitely be happy to point you towards something. So come find us. There'll probably be like a whole little sort of scrum of quantum people. Um, I would say like come find where the nerds are, but this is really a con, so we're all gonna be there. Um, and then uh, just to kind of summarize everything, uh, so we have a new Julia SDK for the bracket service, um, and we want people to try it out and use it and see if it's useful for them, or if not, then that also teaches us something interesting. Um, we're interested in finding out what are Julia users and developers wanting to learn about quantum technology as a whole, uh, especially because we know that there's so many people at JuliaCon who are currently um, you know, doing really cutting-edge cutting edge research in the areas we talked about when we were doing this, the very informal survey at the start of this, so like folks in mathematics, condensed matter, quantum information, um, so we want to understand what tooling you need to be able to do the research you want to do using the actual hardware that's available. Um, and then we also want to know what you would need to make it easier to build and experiment the stuff that you want to test. Um, and then the big open question for me is what are the common areas of interest and need? So the a very obvious gimme answer is we need an open chasm 3 package. Uh, <laughs> Ash is obviously there agreeing. Um, I've had this discussion with several people. So leaving aside the very obvious answer, we need an open chasm package in Julia. What are areas that different groups can work together on to enable the whole community to do things better? Um, and what are the current pain points in Julia, like a feature that's not available or something base is doing that's really frustrating that prevents us uh, as a community from building the software we want to build, um, from being able to study the questions we want to study, what from like the groups making hardware available is not present that people in academia or um, as researchers in industry want to use? Um, what do they need that's not currently available? Or what's available but the experience of using it is really painful? Um, I think that's like for us the real question that's going to enable us to make the Julia Quantum community like very strong coming out of the gate and able to compete with certain other languages. Um, that are very common in the quantum community. Um, so with that, uh, I actually did not use all my time, so we should have lots of time left for questions. Thanks again um, for attending. Uh, I'm Catherine. I'm on Twitter, GitHub with two accounts now, also on Mastodon, um, and I'm out of Blue Sky Code, so sorry about that. Uh, and if you have any questions that you want to ask, we have plenty of time, or you can go to lunch early. So thanks again, um, and yeah. <laughs>
Uh, but we currently basically like offer you like, here's the, the you know, in the Z bases, the bits you measured. Um, and you can choose to do whatever you want with that information. But if you don't know how to make sense of it, then that's very sad. Um, and we do also provide like some transforms. For example, if you want to like change the measurement basis, we're able to support stuff like that. But currently, it's like very low level, which is why I mentioned sort of measurement protocols or like measurement optimization techniques is definitely kind of an area where there's a lot of opportunity to make things better. Um, for example, like we currently don't support povums at all. Uh, povums. Uh, sorry, this is another very annoying jargon. If you don't know what a povum is, it's a positive operator value measurement. And it's a way uh, that you can measure um, or approximate various observables, especially things that have lots of poly strings with fewer measurements. Um, that's like a pretty inaccurate two second summary. But if you're interested and search it on Google, you'll learn a lot about what poems are or aren't. Um, yeah, so I guess to, to actually answer the question you asked, um, there there's like very bare bones support for measurements right now. So if somebody's interested in adding more like compute the fidelity of this gate between these two qubits or something as a high-level routine, that would be very welcome for us. Yes, that would also be extremely cool to have, and it's not currently, I mean, you can implement it, but it's not currently provided. Uh, cool, uh, other questions? Yes, you do. Uh, um, I was just wondering about, uh, you mentioned the open chasm support, because I think I even talked with you about this at IQ Hack. And we needed it at Zapata, and there was nothing available. And I just had to hack something for the limited use we had. Um, but is there nobody even started working on that yet? I mean, I don't have access to like the interior minds of everybody in in the room, even. So I, I don't want to say like nobody has started doing this because probably somebody has. Um, I can say there's definitely like internally in our quantum group people who are working on this, but if um, this would be like generally available. I don't know. Um, so I think it it would be something like if we can definitely discuss this further during the birds of feather session later, which is like more of a general discussion for those who don't know. Sorry, I should have defined that before. Um, if we're you know if this is something we as a community want to work on, even starting during the hackathon, for example, um, that might be something very interesting for everybody to align on, or at least like people who are working as package developers. Uh, other questions? So for the noise models that you mentioned, are these noise models fitted to the hardware systems that you guys specifically have access to? So we don't currently offer like pre-built noise models. So for those who've used IBM Qiskit, you probably have seen that IBM offers like uh, a specific pre-built noise model for like their Lagos device, which is great. Uh, because we offer a bunch of different hardware providers and because you know that hardware is theirs and not ours, um, we allow you the flexibility to kind of build up a hardware model on your own and then you can run it. So for example, if you wanted to do some sort of like reinforcement learning to kind of learn a reasonable noise model for the device, that's something that you would be able to do with some work. Um, but we don't currently offer like, here's our noise model that we imagine is true for this device, especially because probably as many of you know, the noise model that the, or the noise that the device experiences can drift over time. Um, so that's also something that would be great if people want to build, like, you know, here's our community estimation of what the noise model for this device should be. Or if you want to get a little more sophisticated, the device reports these fidelities between these two qubits, like 1Q and 2Q fidelities. So based on that, we think the noise model should be blah, 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 blah. Um, but that's, again, not currently pre-built or provided by us. Do you, have you been thinking about, or? Uh, is there anything in there about um, compilation or circuit transformation? You must have to do layout, for instance, to go to hardware from, from like a, you know, all to all connectivity. Um, so currently the support that the Julia SDK has for like compilation or controlling how that's done is, is pretty bare bones. So for example, we provide like sort of verbatim sections that tells the device, you know, like if you submit to Rigetti, for example, like even if two qubits on Rigetti's device are not directly connected and you submit a C knot between them, you can effectively force their device to not try and compile that C knot. Um, now that may not be a very visible thing to do, but it's possible to do if you want to. Um, but besides that, we don't offer as many um, compilation 
guess, tools or controls yet, as perhaps other providers might. So if someone wants to develop like a pass-through to either talk to them, like uh, for example, Rigetti, uh, Kill, Quill is Rigetti's compiler, yes, or some of the IBM compilers, that would also be something that would be a very cool project. Um, yeah. Yeah, that usually happens after you submit your open chasm to the service. Um, so we do support some native, like for example, on IonQ's device, we support the Molmer Sorensen gate, which I probably mangled the pronunciation of, I'm very sorry, if anybody knows how to pronounce that correctly. Um, but we are definitely looking forward or hoping that folks will build like more sophisticated compiler techniques on top. Um, and I am out of time, so if folks want to discuss more, why don't we do that at lunch? We'll be back here at 2 p.m. Um, I wouldn't necessarily leave your stuff in here because this room isn't like guarded to lock or anything. Uh, but yeah, let's go get some lunch. There's food trucks downstairs. And again, thanks for your attention. Um,
Okay.
Yes. So it's like 11.59, so we're going to get started like literally on the dot so that all the speakers get a chance to present their full talk and everyone gets a chance to ask questions. Um, so people, I guess, will be trickling in as they come in, but we're going to let Roger from QRA get started talking about Yao and Blockade. Um, and this is a 30-minute talk. Uh, so yeah, take it away, Roger. <laughs> introduction, uh, and hello, everyone. Thanks for attending my talk today. I'm Roger Luo, and cur I'm currently a PhD student from Perimeter Institute, and I'm um, also a part-time consultant in QR computing. Uh, I'm also f the author of a few Jula package you might find familiar. So uh, today I will mainly uh, going to talk about the latest development of uh, Yao and Blockade. Um, so uh, I will first give you an update uh, about what we have been working uh, working out around the Yao ecosystem, and then we'll introduce you uh, a now so new package which was released last year but haven't presented JewelCon yet, um, which is uh, SDK for QRS neutral atom computers. Uh, then we'll also talk about some of uh, the new features we're working on in um, towards Yao point uh, two point oh. Um, Okay, so uh, in case you haven't seen my talk uh, in JulaCom 2019, uh, here's a brief review of what, what this is. Um, so it's a, f a framework for quantum algorithm design and quantum software development. It was written, uh, this is written in Julia and has been used in many research projects uh, and also startups. Uh, you can check out uh, uh, the t my talk in JulaCom 2019. Um, and a few highlights for uh, this package. Uh, so we achieved top performance on both CPU and GPU um, in pure Julia, um, and uh, compared with uh, all other uh, nice C++ simulators as well, uh, and we're uh, differentiable, so we can differentiate the quantum circuit, get a gradient, and uh, optimize your uh, parameters on the quantum circuit. Uh, and we support some basic uh, symbolic calculations through, uh, uh, through symbolic engines. Uh, so what's new in Yao uh, since uh, last time we speak on Julicom? So uh, I guess someone mentioned Open Chasm uh, in the morning. So uh, one thing we have is uh, a new package called Open Chasm, uh, also not quite new either. Um, and uh, it's, uh, 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 it provides a pure Julia-based positive for Open Chasm language and uh, a compiler called Yao Blocks Chasm that can convert uh, Yelp's representation to open chasm. Uh, and uh, uh, this Yelp, uh, Yelp block chasm package is actually supported by Unitary Hat and it's done by R Sharma. 
And uh, in order to support uh, and implement uh, all these features uh, for parsing, uh, we, we not only work on quantum stuff, we actually contribute uh, a whole tool chain for the general um, Julia community. That includes the pattern matching system, ML style, and the parser generator, RBNF, uh, a restricted BNF format. Um, so um, uh, here uh, is a picture you can see that we actually parse the string of OpenCASM 2.0, and then we generate uh, the EST. That is why we can uh, a syntax provide syntax highlighting in the terminal. Um, so uh, the other, the next thing is the ZS calculus. So ZS calculus is a, a graphic language to help you simplify your quantum circuits. Uh, or even you can use it to just reason about your quantum circuit to figure out if uh, uh, what's the variance of your gradient, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, we, uh, we, we developed this package called ZS Calculus, which gives you an uh, engine to, cal uh, to evaluate the ZS Calculus based on a given circuit. So here is a, a demo from the package documentation that uh, shows you a quantum circuit after converted to ZS Calculus, and then we can show the corresponding uh, ZS Calculus diagram. Um, and uh, uh, a working progress uh, in, uh, project this summer is uh, aims to support also support another version called uh, ZW cal Calculus uh, into this package as well. And this project is led by our one of our developer called Chen uh, Chen Zhao, He's, who is also now uh, in QR computing. Um, and uh, this package is still in its early stage, and we're working on integrating uh, with other parts of of Yale, and uh, uh, please feel free to um, try it out and contribute uh, or submit issues. Um, so there are some other uh, features that uh, I don't won't have time to go into more details. Um, so we have uh, we, st uh, we we start so to support multi levels in quantum circuit simulation since last year, uh, and we added more density matrix operations. Uh, such as uh, some basic channels, noise channels, uh, and uh, um, we also have the plotting now. Um, and if you want to convert uh, a quantum circuit and simulate using Tensor Network algorithms, uh, Yao to NSAM allows you to convert uh, uh, Yao's representation to a Tensor Network representation. And then you can further process uh, the Tensor Network to get what, whatever you want. Uh, if you're interested in this part, uh, check out uh, Jingguo Liu's talk today, uh, OM Ainsam at uh, 4.15. Uh, um, and of course, we have many more small improvements since last time. And, uh, and worth mentioning, we have uh, this nice um, package from the community by, uh, by Jian, uh, who developed a fermionic linear optics simulator backend for Yao. Um, and it's uh, also located in the same organization, if you want to check it out. Um, so next, uh, the, uh, let me introduce the other package. Um, so we started uh, back in 2020 when, started, when the COVID starts. Uh, we started a collaboration with QR Computing and Harvard. Uh, and QR Computing is a startup developed a new, uh, is start building neutral atom computing devices. And uh, in the collaboration, we start uh, uh, realize that there are lots of problem in um, in in the practice that is relevant to simulating uh, quantum dynamics. And we uh, based uh, based on on top of Yao, we start develop this uh, blocky package, which uh, is the neutral atom um, SDK for QRS device. Um, and this was also an exploration for us to expand Yao's scope to more general quantum operators. So what exactly does package do? Um, so in, uh, in a simple sentence, uh, it, it simulates this Hamiltonian. And, uh, and this Hamiltonian describes uh, uh, the evolution of uh, the so-called river system, which are some uh, code atoms and can be evolved uh, by uh, by some laser beams and then into another state. Uh, this is how uh, this is this is roughly how what the machine does as well. 
So the goal, um, so this package does a few things, well actually two things. Uh, fast simu emulation of uh, uh, this Hamptonian, and that includes exact simulation, um, simulate in SAS space, and stochastic series expansion, which uh, simulates finite temperature and ground states. Um, and it also supports submitting jobs to real hardware. Uh, as Catherine talking in the morning, uh, this is actually done through Bracket. Um, and all these are in one unified interface, uh, of course. Um, so uh, the, uh, as our tradition, uh, if we want to, sh want to show a new package in, in Julicon, we need to show it's better than uh, other implementations. So here we here we go. We have a benchmark with. Uh, uh, so we didn't really really find any other um, implementation like this except Qtip uh, in, in the Python world. So so that's why uh, the benchmark here only compare with Qtip. Um, and uh, we uh, and uh, here. Uh, so we compare the Qtip CPU simulation with uh, our both CPU and GPU simulation. Uh, the, the font is probably a little small. Uh, I kind of cropped this picture from our documentation. Um, so uh, as you can see, uh, but you can roughly see that uh, our GPU simulation uh, can be at most uh, eight, uh, 80 times faster than the CPU. Um, Maybe let me make this a little bigger. Oh. Uh, bigger is better, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, b b bigger is worse. Uh, and, uh, Uh, one sec. Uh, the the top one is uh, is time. So the top one bigger is worse. Worse. The last two uh, bigger is better. Uh, is the speed up count. So so the the largest uh, column is the green one, which is the uh, GPU version, um, and that's uh, and most uh, you can see uh, it's actually uh, uh, eighty times. Uh, in the plot, you can probably see it's around uh, 100 for the second uh, simulation. Okay. Um, the other is the uh, Mancala simulation. So we don't. We don't uh, this simulator doesn't seem to exist to any have any existing implementation. Uh, in, uh, and there there are some old uh, quantum Mancala simulation in the old package called Alps, uh, but. Uh, we don't find any rework, uh, like anything made for rework. Uh, this is based on early work from uh, AJS and uh, uh, and our intern Anna Knur finish uh, pushed this to uh, into the repo and um, polished the tutorial. Uh, here is a simple demonstration of uh, um, of, uh, of the value uh, of the expectation value compared uh, with uh, uh, exact diagonalization. And uh, oh, sorry. Yes, still has a stochastic series expansion. So it's oh. one was a kind of uh, quantum Calo algorithm. Uh, the reason why you would want to use this kind of simulator is uh, uh, this kind of simulator allows you to scale up to a very large size, uh, such as 20 by 20 uh, lattices. Um, and but the limitation is it can only simulate. Uh, uh, some, uh, a set of Hamiltonian called sine free Hamiltonian, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it can only simulate uh, static Hamiltonian in our case. Um, so, which is the ground state of uh, our uh, Ruber Hamiltonian in the beginning, or finite temperature um, observables of uh, that Hamiltonian. Um, and uh, also, we uh, we can you can uh, connect to real hardware as uh, Catherine show you in the morning. Um, so here is a, a very small code demo um, that uh, you can submit a very simple pulse program to the real machine uh, located in Curara that has uh, uh, 256 atoms. Um, and uh, uh, of course we're not uh, 
Uh, and we're not actually satisfied with the current performance and accuracy of blocking yet. Uh, so uh, we're still working on a few improvements. That's this including uh, implementation of AC uh, FET solvers, um, but, uh, which is currently worked by our intern sitting down there, Kai. Um, so this, this is his nice plotting comparing, uh, uh, he also works on improving the uh, matrix, matrix exponential algorithms. So here's a nice plot from uh, him that's uh, showing that uh, our, uh, this new method uh, that we pour from NumPy have significantly less calls to the matrix multiplication. Um, and uh, the other thing is uh, a new post language so that we can spe specialize for compilation also for uh, help you validate your program in the cloud. So, uh, so what's the trick behind all this stuff? There's actually a simple trick behind all these uh, uh, simulation and uh, compilation tasks uh, that is uh, dispatched by some symbolic patterns. And, and in each package and it, at each level, we define an expression, describe what the task we want to do, and we usually call them intermediate representations. So from here, you can, uh, you can see for block expression, that actually defines how the river system uh, works and uh, what, what needs to be input as your parameter for the river system. And then uh, your blocks actually gives you a general description of uh, uh, quantum operations. For example, uh, you have polys, polys uh, and you, have, you can add them together, and maybe you can want to calculate their commutators. So these operations are defined in your blocks. And from there, we can do a bunch of stuff like uh, uh, compile to chasm if, if it happens to be a quantum circuit. Uh, uh, or uh, if uh, this is the Hamiltonian pulse description, uh, we can compile that to JSON schema and uh, submit the job to QR and then run a real hardware. Um, or if you want to simulate dynamics, uh, we, we can compile this to a sum of linear operators, which is uh, what uh, which we can further input uh, put into an ODE solver. Um, and then we can simulate the, uh, we can run our time evolution simulation primitives. So this does not only allow us to utilize the uh, dif differential equation ecosystem in Julia, but also allows us to utilize uh, some, uh, to, to reuse some uh, simulation primitives uh, from, from Yale, such as, uh, for, for example, if, if your operator is, uh, uh, a sum of x or a chronic of x, you don't actually need to store the whole matrix, and you can directly apply the operator on a state. And we have a specialized uh, uh, instructions to implement these kind of operations for you, which is usually faster than just to uh, multiply your matrix. Uh, and, and last uh, is our old uh, circuit simulation primitives. And uh, uh, also I here I didn't actually draw if you See Jingwo's talk, you can also convert your blocks to uh, OM and some representations, which is, is a language for uh, tensor networks. And then from there, you can figure out what's the right contraction order for your tensor network simulation. Um, and the main dispatch engine we use here is uh, ba actually ba uh, uh, based on Julius multiple dispatch in the early days, where we, uh, we uh, uh, neither, of, uh, neither of the developers actually know much about what is uh, pattern matching and functional programming. Uh, but uh, uh, with the time grows uh, and uh, we have, uh, we start learning what is uh, um, more fancy programming uh, tools. So we have uh, ML style, which pours the uh, a f uh, a functional language called uh, ML family, for example, OCaml. Uh, so this pour the, uh, those feature into Julia, and then we start to use the pattern match system from uh, ML style, and, and you will find some of the uh, some of the expression object actually supports ML style pattern matches uh, pattern matchers. Uh, so this this risk system allows us to not just do stance uh, simulation, and we can do uh, many different things by specializing on symbolic patterns. Um, and uh, uh, but of course, there is, this, this is, does not come for free. So we also learn a lot of lessons when we uh, working on, around this. 
Um, so, so Yelp Blocks was initially actually uh, not designed for general quantum operations and was mainly designed for quantum circuits. And uh, you find it uh, type unstable when you ma want to manipulate the ex expression, as uh, John uh, just mentioned in the morning. Now you need some trick to make things uh, type stable. And this will affect uh, the speed of uh, trans uh, transforming your expression a lot uh, in a Julia program. And uh, uh, also we don't really have a support for declaring bases unlike what we have in quantum optics. Um, and the other thing is when we, actually, when we design our uh, intermediate representation, we didn't really consider the semantics carefully. So it resulted in some redundant semantics causing ambiguity and uh, caused uh, bad code reuse. Um, also, also it's, it's not fully support, uh, it does not fully support pattern matching provided by ML style. Um, so uh, sometimes you might find um, patterns you expect to work doesn't work and uh, uh, which is kind of painful for writing complicated transforms. So uh, the solution to, uh, to solve this would be the Julia 2.0, although we never tag 1.0, but the API is actually quite stable um, for, for quite a long time. And, uh, uh, and, this, uh, and uh, we're expecting YAL 2.0 to include a, a major rewrite of YAL blocks and many other improvements. Um, and, uh, um, and we hope that uh, we, we can have a type stable uh, expression to express quant general quantum operations and a rewrite of ML style that uh, provides neat syntax for better uh, pattern matching. So this is, a, uh, this is a, 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 at least an exciting work in progress project to me is, uh, uh, is an ambitious solution that we try to uh, rewrite your blocks with a formalized uh, uh, language, uh, first defined as uh, some BNF syntax, uh, and we have more detailed documentation to define what our H semantic means. Um, and this uh, this new language based on is based on our lessons we learned from your blocks and QSpin, and also another failed project that some of you might have seen before called your compiler. Um, so we we realize uh, in this process we actually realize the Julia ecosystem is lack of tooling for such applications. So as a start, we actually uh, did some improvement on in the journal tool chain. So that includes porting uh, type stable algebra data type uh, combined with uh, uh, ML style pattern match engine and some improvement to ML style into the Julia. So if you're interested in, uh, in this part, uh, check out my uh, talk later today at 3 p.m. Uh, I guess it's 3 p.m. It's called Xpronicle. Uh, I guess I finish faster than the uh, time should be. Um, so uh, any questions? And uh, also, uh, I guess I don't have enough time to go through all the tutorials. If you're interested, there, yeah, I'll block it. We have a lot of It, the, the space is kind of limited, so there are only like first uh, 15 um, people. So uh, we'll, uh, please go to our booth and sign up. Uh, also, lunch is included um, if, if uh, this convince you. Um, OK, any questions, I guess? Thank you for the talk. Um, I was just wondering, did you ever compare the performance of Locate with quantum optics that uh, Not really, because uh, uh, we find it's, uh, so for CPU, uh, it should be identical because we're both calling DVQ, unless the uh, matrix are not specialized enough, but that definitely should be like a bond. 
And uh, for GPU, we find quantum optics, uh, as far as I know, doesn't cannot do GPU. So like, there's no point to compare something not supported. Yeah, thanks. So is the intention for the ZX calculus package to be like on par with the Python one and the ROS one, or is it like an experimental thing? It's more experimental take it because uh, we uh, we want to make use of some other tools, a symbolic tools in Julia, such as meta theory, and uh, uh, those two doesn't really exist in Python. Um, and uh, we uh, we don't cover all the features of physics, but we do have. Uh, but uh, we do get a free speed up compared to physics, like a six, six time in some instances. Um, but also the compilation speed is doesn't really matter for. Or the next list. Well, have you compared to quizzes? Or not? Uh, not, uh, not really, because the. Uh, are you talking about Rust? Yeah, the Rust. Yeah, so uh, that happens uh, like uh, a bit later when we go to our benchmark release, so we haven't had the time to check that out. Right. I have another question back here. Oh. You mentioned that in uh, the current version of EL, there's something lacking compared to quantum optics, defining uh, arbitrary basis. That's actually the use case that was kind of important for me when deciding between those two tools. I really need something that can do more than just qubits. Could you elaborate on what the plans there are, what would be the near term capabilities for analog, non qubit physics? Oh, yes. Uh, so uh, the near term. So the near term plan is to, uh, in order to actually define this, uh, these uh, formal languages, so we need a good way to define an abstract syntax tree. So um, my near term spare time will be mainly on um, improve the tooling first. And then uh, in terms of the actual support of the basis, uh, I think uh, within the language, uh, with, with, within this language design, this is kind of easy to support because we already figured out uh, the corresponding uh, semantics. Uh, but in terms of, uh, but, but, in, uh, but based on that, uh, some further development to uh, include, uh, uh, for example, generate uh, mat uh, matrix uh, from the expression or just generate a wine entry given the basis. Uh, so these are more important to the actual simulators. I don't really uh, have a detailed plan for those, but uh, we, we, we did consider uh, these use cases. Thank you. Have we got other questions? Anybody? We still have a few minutes, so if someone has another question. Can you say, or, or yeah, maybe I should take this? I got a booming voice anyway, but um, uh, sometimes I'm told. Uh, I'm wondering about um, what a little bit about these representations that you use pattern matching on. So, for the, you talk about this as a solution to a certain extent to a dispatch system, but I'm, I'm having it's a little fuzzy to me. Are these like um, um, expression trees? Uh, that you roll your own expression tree and send those around, or yes, for uh, for some of the uh, representations, you're essentially just the syntax tree uh, of some language we defined, um, and uh, uh, this is not true for ZS calculus uh, and some other graphic graph-based representations. So those are uh, those representations are uh, graphs, and we currently do not. Uh, uh, patch general graph matching. Uh, we do in order to implement that calculus. We do implement it, uh, some naive pattern matchers for the graphs. I see. So these you will have a, like a syntax tree, and um, in order to recognize, uh, rather than go detailed, uh, go through that in a detailed way with if else statements, you'll use something like an else style. Yes. Thanks. Okay, we probably have time for one more. If anybody has any last questions?
Ah, let's thank our speaker. Oh, sorry, actually. Yeah. I just want to ask, you mentioned in Brocade, a representation of pulse information. Uh, can you describe that representation a little bit? Is it, is it, is it related at all to like, open polls or is it something completely different? Uh, it's something more specialized to the machine, okay. so it's not uh, open polls. Um, it's, uh, uh, it, yeah, it, it, it's, it's uh, because the polls program uh, on QRS machine is actually simpler than what the polls describes. So we want to, want to remove some redundant semantics. So, so things get simpler. Okay, so it's more specialized. Yeah. yeah. Cool, so it looks like Roger and for a great talk. Um, and our next speaker is Michael Gertz talking about quantum control. Seem like it's recognizing the And then as part of that, we also have a quantum propagator package uh, that simulates quantum dynamics. Um, so, so what is quantum control? So it's, it's basically the question of how to actively steer a quantum system in some desired way. Um, so I think a lot of you are coming from quantum computing, uh, and certainly all the talks you've heard today are, are quantum computing. Um, so usually you're working at the level of a circuit diagram, uh, like this from the Yao documentation that, that Roger just talked about. Uh, or you have packages like Qiskit or Bracket uh, that we also heard about today. Uh, but now from a control perspective, what we're interested in is how exactly would you implement one of these gates physically, uh, like this controlled rotation, for example, right? So in Qiskit, at least in the last couple of years, uh, they've added what they call pulse level control, and also in, in, in Bracket, uh, like Catherine uh, talked about earlier. Uh, so that's really what we're talking about here, all right? And, and this really goes to the physics of the platform that you're running your, your quantum computer on. Uh, so for example, if you have a superconducting qubit, uh, you'd have something like this transmon circuit, uh, where you have two transmons uh, with a shared transmission line, and the control that you have in this case is the field that you, the microwave field that you put into the transmission line. And now we're going to try, and try to find a field uh, so that every logical basis state for the two qubit system evolves so that it implements this controlled rotation. Um, but there's also other problems besides just implementing uh, quantum gates. Uh, so for example, if you have uh, trapped ions in a segmented trap, you might want to move them over some distance. Uh, and the control in that case uh, would be the voltage that's applied to every one of these, these segments, uh, and then you sort of create a trap potential that you can move uh, to, to move the ion along. Uh, and, and you could build that into some kind of complex shuffling of atoms on a 2D chip, for example. So that's, that's like a typical uh, control problem or something that's actually closer uh, to what I'm doing these days, is uh, you, you could have uh, some trapped atoms uh, where you split them into, into two trapping potentials, and then you move these potentials along uh, two different pathways to implement an interferometer. 
uh, and then you have to find exactly the right trajectory of these of these structure beams uh, to combine the the wave packets again at the end. Um, so that's that's all examples for uh, quantum control. Um, so traditionally, we've done this in Fortran. Uh, so for example, with this QDEN library uh, that I was the maintainer of during my PhD, and, and Fortran is really a very nice language uh, for the kind of numerics that you have to do here. But there's there's kind of two problems with Fortran. So one is just the workflow. So you end up just uh, writing Python scripts usually uh, for the modeling, like you use Qtip or something, and then you write out data and you write config files. Uh, so there's a lot of files on disk, and then you run your Fortran program, and then you do your analysis in Python again. And there's just a lot of overhead with managing all of that data. Uh, and the other problem is flexibility. So so once you have like a really big library, uh, you want to do something new maybe that doesn't really quite fit into the existing data structures. Um, and then things just get more sprawling and complicated in the code. Uh, so that's, that's definitely a problem. So you, 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 know, you might just start out uh, with basic energy levels, like for the transmon, but then you also want to do molecular dynamics or, or uh, molecular rotations or spin systems, uh, and then you have to just manage all these different data structures and code paths. Uh, so we also try to port some of those optimization methods to Python, and that works pretty well as far as the optimization itself is concerned, and it definitely makes the workflow easier because you can you know, you can do that in, in, in Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, but the, the problem is that for the underlying simulation of the quantum dynamics, uh, the performance just isn't there. And on top of that, you have the, the GIL in Python, so the, the global interpreter lock, and that really kills the kind of parallelization that you'd, you'd like to do uh, for this type of thing. Um, so then you have to start doing something like Scython, and that just gets very technical uh, and, and sort of very annoying, and then you run into sort of all kinds of uh, packaging and compilation problems, so it's really not a lot of fun. And, and, and on top of that, really neither Python nor C really have very good semantics for the kind of numerics that we want to do. Okay, so why Julia then? Um, so the first aspect is definitely flexibility, and that was sort of the original motivation for me. Uh, so compared to Fortran, you have a much nicer workflow. Again, you can do it in notebooks, uh, but you also have multiple dispatch to solve the problem that you want to do sort of unusual things with custom data structures that are sort of particular to the physics of a given problem. Um, and um, so that, that just separates extremely well in Julia. And, and then, of course, the second aspect is performance, uh, especially compared to Python. And that really becomes relevant for open quantum systems or noisy systems. So not really the examples I show later uh, in this talk, uh, but sort of you know, the actual sort of research systems uh, where the optimization might actually run uh, for several weeks on a cluster. And it's really not something that, that you can scale Python to. And then last but not least, Julia also has really nice expressiveness compared to both Fortran and to, to Python uh, with a real focus on linear algebra and, and you know, Unicode and, and things like multiple dispatch. So it's really a very pleasant language to work in uh, for these kinds of problems. Okay, so let's just jump into an example. Uh, so this is something that I've adapted from one of the examples in the documentation. And I go into some of the details and the design principles of the quantum control package as we go along. Uh, so the example is just going to be the same one that I, I mentioned before, uh, which is these two superconducting transform qubits coupled to a shared transmission line. And uh, just for simplicity, <coughs> I'm going to assume that what, in what's called the dispersive limit, uh, where the coupling between the qubit and the cavity is relatively small, uh, so you can adiabatically eliminate the cavity. And, and what you end up with is uh, the microwave field that you put into the cavity here. Um, that ends up effectively driving the transitions of the qubit. Uh, and then on, on top of that, you also have a static qubit-qubit interaction between the two qubits. Um, so the energies of these qubits are on the order of uh, gigahertz, uh, which means that there's a, a time scale of uh, nanoseconds. Uh, and we're going to truncate the levels of this qubit uh, to six levels. Um, so that means that the dimension of the total Hilbert space it's going to be 36, uh, which is not too big, but it's also not completely trivial. Okay, so now we can write out the Hamiltonian. And uh, well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to a rotating frame, which means that we shift the qubit frequencies down by the, by the driving frequency. And the other thing that that does now, it, it, now the control field is going to be complex, uh, where the, the complex phase of the field tells you the deviation from the drive frequency. Uh, well, and beyond that, now we can just write out the Hamiltonian sort of in a very straightforward way that basically looks like you would write it uh, on paper. Uh, so we have this anharmonic duffing oscillator for the two transmons uh, here and here. And uh, then we have a static interaction term there. 
And uh, for the control term, we want to treat the real part and the imaginary part of the control as two independent control fields, uh, just because the control kind of at the, at the control level always has to be a, a real valued function. So we split that into two terms. Um, so let me just talk about this, this Hamiltonian function that I'm using here. Um, so the underlying concept that's really pretty central uh, to the quantum control package is that of a dynamical generator, which is the object that describes the, the dynamics of the state. So it's the, the time-dependent Hamiltonian or the Liouvillian. Uh, and mathematically, that's, that structure is most direct, that's most directly supported is this equation here, where you have a drift term and then you have control operators that get multiplied with a control amplitude. And then that control amplitude uh, can depend on one or more control functions, epsilon, and the epsilon is what you, what you directly manipulate with the, the optimal control. Right? So that's what you change. And then the, the, uh, the amplitude is going to be on top of that. Um, so, so in many cases, the control amplitude is actually just directly the control function, uh, and then you get this linear control Hamiltonian down here. Um, but in general, you could have an amplitude where maybe you add noise on top of your control, or you have, you have something that depends nonlinearly, like maybe a spin orbit coupling that's quadratic in the field, uh, or you have some transform function in your waveform generator where the, you know, the thing that comes out isn't actually what you put in exactly, or there's really a lot of other things uh, you could use for this, for this amplitude versus, versus the actual control. So it's, it's really quite flexible. Um, and, and the call to the Hamiltonian gives you exactly the structure where you give it tuples of control operators and control amplitudes. Um, but in fact, you could be even more general. Um, so you could have an operators that depends in some completely arbitrary way uh, on any number of control functions, maybe like element-wise sort of controls inside of your, of your Hamiltonian. Um, so ultimately, we just have an abstract interface uh, for what you're allowed to use as a dynamical generator. Uh, so basically, you have to be able to extract controls, uh, which are just scalar functions or arrays, because otherwise you don't have anything to do the optimal control on, right? So there needs to be like a, a notion of what is a control. Uh, and then you have to be able to evaluate your generator by plugging in values for the controls, and, and also at a particular point in time. And that has to give you an operator, and the operator has its own interface, but it's basically just a, an object uh, for, for which you define all the linear algebra operations. So basically, you just have to be able to apply it to a state, right? So you have to, you have to implement like the mall uh, function for that. Um, so the important takeaway is that the quantum control package is not a modeling framework. And what I mean is that in something like quantum optics, like we heard today, you have data structures that are specific to the physics of the problem, right? So you have like position operators or momentum operators or Gaussian states or, or anything like that. And that's not something that, that you would have in the quantum control package. Uh, but the idea would be that you can take these data structures from quantum optics or, or other packages, or maybe you know, something like a matrix product state or anything else that you might have, and then use them as components of the dynamical generator in the quantum control together with the control functions and the control amplitudes. And I guess the, the caveat is uh, what, what Ashley talked about this morning is that there's this new time dependence in quantum optics, which actually looks to me like it's almost one-to-one -one with the interface that I just described. So that should be uh, quite compatible. All right, so let's get back to the example uh, and talk about the initial guess for the driving field. Uh, so this is going to be an example of what I just talked about, so the distinction between a control amplitude and a control field. So physically, what we want to have as a, as a control amplitude, as sort of initial guess, is something that switches on from zero to 35 megahertz and then stays constant for about 400 nanoseconds and then switches down again. Uh, and we're going to separate that into a shape that's just going to stay fixed, so the, the optimization isn't going to touch it, and the shape is just going from zero to one and stays, stays at one and then goes down again. Uh, and then we're going to multiply that um, with a, an arbitrary control function uh, and initially, that control function is just going to be a constant 35 megahertz, right? And we're, we're, we're also going to assume that we're at the driving frequency, uh, which means that the imaginary part initially is going to be zero. Okay, so now we can instantiate that. And, and if you plot it, uh, you can see that it's exactly what I just described. Okay, and uh, so now we can instantiate the Hamiltonian based on that. Uh, and, and now for the states, uh, so for the states, we have a logical subspace of the two uh, lowest levels for each of the two qubits, so that's going to be the zero and the one, but then we have additional levels on top of that, uh, which we truncated to six, and, and we'll tensor that into a logical basis for the two qubit system. Um, and uh, if we look at just one of those states, we'll see it's, you know, it's a 36 dimensional vector, it has a one in a particular place, and zero everything else, so it's like a, you know, a padded uh, a sort of two qubit state. Um, okay, so let's look at the dynamics of the system. 
Um, so we're going to use this propagate function, and this function is it's what simulate the time dynamics. Uh, but uh, so so we have the Schrodinger equation, or we have the you know you have the Liouville equation if it's an open system, which is actually the same equation, uh, with some number of control fields, which we call epsilon and L. So that's like the real field and the imaginary field. Uh, so why not just throw this into differential equations, or use the dynamic solver from quantum optics, or something like that, right? So there's many packages that you can just simulate this this Schrodinger equation. Um, so remember that we're going to change the control fields via the optimal control, right? And if you want to have a control procedure that really gives you arbitrary control functions as, a, as an output, then pretty much what you have to do is you have to discretize it to some time grid. And then the standard thing to do is just to take the controls and, and assume that they're piecewise constant on that time grid, right? So using a small time grid here. Uh, and then the optimal control will just tune the values for the, for the field at the different points in time. Um, so, so now, actually, you don't actually have to solve this differential equation as an equation, but you actually know analytically what the propagator is going to be, and it's just you know e to the minus i h dt for any particular time slice. Uh, and now you can just evaluate that uh, by expanding the application of that propagator into a polynomial expansion. So think something like a Taylor series, but in fact, a Taylor series is, is actually a very badly converging series. Uh, so instead. You can use Chebyshev polynomials uh, if the generator only has real eigenvalues because you know, Chebyshev polynomials are only defined on the real axis, or Newton polynomials, uh, for example, for an open quantum system if it's, if it's a non-Hermitian uh, generator. Uh, and again, all of this is implemented uh, via, via an abstract interface. So you can, uh, you, know, you can implement propagators where you just, all you need is an init prop function that sort of sets up the, the thing that holds the state of the propagation, and then you step through the time grid with a prop step function. The Schrodinger equation is implicit in this, uh, but if you have something different, like maybe a gross pitayevsky equation or something like that, you could define your own propagator just you know, according to that interface. Uh, okay, so let's get back to the example. Um, so we're going to be interested in what happens with this system in the logical subspace. Uh, and we're going to define this observable, uh, where we take the overlap of the, of the state that we're propagating with every one of the logical basis states. Right? So that tells you what's going on in that, in that logical subspace. Um, and we, we were, so we're going to propagate all of the basis states. Uh, so if we do that for all of the basis states, uh, because we have this, this parameter storage equals to true, uh, what you're going to get out, just for sort of the last of them, it's, it's a matrix of the complex projections at every point in time. Uh, and now we can just concatenate that uh, to get a four by four matrix at every point in time. So that's the, the gate that you got uh, in the logical subspace at every point in time. Okay, and well, now in order to analyze that, uh, we're going to use something called a gate concurrence. So gate concurrence is just a measure of how much entanglement you can get if you apply the gate to, to some specific separable input state. And, and probably the most well-known uh, perfectly entangling gate is, is a C0 gate, and we can indeed verify that uh, if, we, if we calculate the gate concurrence uh, for a C0 that we get one. Okay, so now if you look at the gate concurrence for a dynamic, so how much entanglement are we generating? Um, we, we see that it starts at zero, because obviously at, at zero the gate is the identity, uh, but then it fluctuates a bit, and then it, but it only goes to around 78%, uh, and so it's not a perfectly entangling gate. Uh, and the other thing that we should look at, uh, because we have these extra levels in the transmon, uh, is the loss of the population from the logical subspace. So we can just uh, you know, plot a unitarity measure here, and we see that we end up, uh, we, we lose about 10% of the population from the logical subspace at the end. Okay, so now let's do an optimization where we maximize the gate concurrence. Um, so we're going to define these objectives. Uh, uh, so these are also pretty central to the, the quantum control package. Uh, so these objectives just tell you which states should the optimization look at and how should they evolve. And in many optimizations you have something, uh, you have a target state in there, but here it's actually a little bit more general because we're maximizing entanglement. So there's no specific target state, uh, so we just have an initial state and then we have the Hamiltonian in there as the generator to tell you how the state should evolve. Okay. Um, so now we're also going to define a, uh, a, an actual functional that we're going to minimize. And that, that functional is going to be the combination of the gate concurrence and the unitarity. So we're going to minimize the loss from the logical subspace while we're maximizing the, the entangling power. Uh, so the, this functional should be zero in the optimal case. And we can check that for our time evolution, it's still pretty far from zero. Um, and just for formal reasons, so this, this functional that I defined there, it's a function of a four by four matrix, but what we actually need uh, to give the, the optimization routine is a function that takes the propagated states as input. Uh, so we just have this, this gate function routine here uh, that does that conversion. 
Um, OK, so now I, I actually kind of skipped over how we actually minimize the optimization functional. Right? So, so remember that we've discretized the control field to be piecewise constant. Um, so our control parameters are the values of the different controls, epsilon L, at different time slices n. And, and what we want to do is we want to change the values of epsilon and L in the direction of the gradient uh, of the functional with respect to that particular value, right? So it's a, it's a gradient-based optimization. So you just change your field in the direction of the gradient. Um, uh, and now our functional is, uh, so functional is basically the gate concurrence. So how is that actually calculated? Well, so for any four by four matrix, uh, you, you, what you do is you take this partially rotated matrix utility and then you calculate these values, C1, C2, C3, from the eigenvalues of that product. And so these C1s and C2 and C3 are called uh, wild chamber coordinates. And then you can get the gate concurrence by looking at all the possible combinations of the C1, C2, C3, and, and finding the maximum of this sign. Um, but, but just from the fact that you have to calculate eigenvalues, uh, it's not something where you have an analytic gradient, right? You can't just write down the derivative of this procedure. Um, so something that people like to do now is to use just do automatic differentiation. Uh, but what that would actually mean is that you would have to do the entire propagation inside of an AD framework. And that means that you're going to be building a computational graph. And that's a huge computational graph that's just totally going to explode your, your memory. So that's not really practical for, for any kind of larger Hilbert space or, or you know, a lot of time steps or anything like really uh, sort of uh, uh, difficult. Um, so instead, what we came up with is this idea of, of semi-automatic differentiation. So let's just very briefly go over what that means. Um, so this is the gradient that we want to calculate, right? Uh, so the derivative uh, with respect to the, to the control values. And now we're just going to formally write the functional as depending on the propagated states. Uh, so that would be the two qubit bases uh, in, our, in, our, in our case. Uh, and then we can do just a chain rule. Uh, and now this derivative of a scalar with respect to a column vector, uh, that's going to be a row vector. And we just call that uh, bra chi. Uh, and now we're going to pull out that derivative with respect to the controls forward. And, and then this whole thing just turns into a gradient of the overlap between that state chi and the propagated state psi. Uh, and the gradient of an overlap of two states, that's actually something that's very well understood numerically. Uh, so there's, there's a pretty straightforward existing scheme. Uh, and basically what it comes down to is you, you forward propagate the psi, you store all the propagated states uh, for every point in time, and then you do a backward propagation of that chi uh, and then take the overlaps at every point in time to get the gradient. So it's a, it's a, it's a very sort of standard scheme uh, and well understood. And, and for the details of that, I would refer you either to the paper uh, or to this talk that I gave a, a few months ago. And that also includes the benchmark to show you uh, how a direct uh, AD would, doesn't really scale uh, numerically. Okay, so let's get back to the example. Uh, so we're going to use this uh, functional make uh, gate chi, and that's going to do exactly what I just described. <laughs> So it's going to use automatic differentiation to calculate the chi that is the derivative of the functional with respect to the state. Uh, and you see here that you know, the output is some function uh, that involves zygote. That's, that's where the AD comes in. Um, well, and, this is, uh, and, and with this, we can just set up the control problem. Uh, so the control problem is just going to be the list of objective. So that's the states that we want to look at and, and the Hamiltonian. Uh, and we give it a time grid. We give it the optimization functional, and we give it this chi state that we just constructed uh, uh, with automatic differentiation. So that's going to be part of the gradient. Uh, and then we're going to give it a rule for when we want to stop. OK, so now we can just run this uh, using this optimize function. Uh, so I'll just, I'll just call that. And um, we see the optimization sort of slowly converging to 0. And in about five seconds or so, we end up with an optimization result. Uh, and now we can, we can plot the optimized field. Uh, so you see that you get these oscillations here that you didn't have before. And uh, I guess we, we can also look at the, the dynamics under that optimized field. Um, so we're going to extract the original controls from the Hamiltonian using this get controls function. And now we're going to construct a new Hamiltonian where we just substitute the guess, con the guess controls with the newly optimized controls uh, from the res result object. Uh, and we can propagate that in the exact same way as before. So and extract the, the four by four gate at every point in time. And now if we, if we plot the gate concurrence of these new dynamics, we see that if we compare it to the guest pulse, uh, we end up now with a gate concurrence of one. So we have a, a perfectly entangling uh, quantum gate. Um, and also if we look at the loss from the subspace, we see that it's still going to oscillate. Um, but but uh, now at the end, it's going down basically to zero. 
right? And that, that's all for the example. Um, so, so now what about performance? So as I, as I showed before, um, so one evaluation of the gradient requires two time propagations over the entire time group. Uh, so the, the numerical cost of the optimization is really identical to the cost of just simulating the dynamics. Um, so this is the, this is the runtime for simulating dynamics uh, for 1,000 time steps for a Hilbert space dimension of 1,000. And, and the baseline that I'm showing here is the Fortran code that we were using previously. And uh, with Fortran, it actually matters quite a lot which compiler you're using. So if you're using a commercial compiler like iFort, you might actually get something like a full factor of two. Okay, so now what about Julia? Uh, well, we can see that Julia matches the performance of the Fortran code with iFort. It's actually even a little bit better, uh, but you know, just a few percent. Uh, but then there's also the flexibility of, of Julia that you can just, you know, you can use different data structures. So for example, you could use a GPU data structure and make this entire propagation run on the GPU, and you almost get a factor of three in performance. And I didn't rewrite anything for this, right? So the only, I've never, I've never done GPU computing before, so the only thing I did is switch out the regular arrays with GPU arrays. And similarly, if you use sparse matrices, uh, so in Fortran we have our own implementation of sparse matrices, uh, and, uh, but then in Julia you have it built in, right? And it turns out, uh, well, apparently the people who implemented sparse matrices in Julia are better programmers than me because it's twice as fast. Uh, or if you go to really small Hilbert spaces, uh, so this is a Hilbert space dimension 10. So there Julia again matches the performance of the Fortran code. Uh, but then in Julia you also have static arrays, right, which are designed to work with, with, really, small, uh, with really small vectors. Uh, and again, you get an additional factor of two uh, just to do that. Um, Okay, so, so, and this is actually a surprise. Uh, so we sort of, the reason I started to use Julia was mainly for the flexibility, and we thought that maybe, okay, maybe if you get a factor of two compared to the Fortran code, that's already a win because, you know, it makes you more productive, but it turns out that Julia is actually faster than Fortran. Okay, and uh, so I guess I still have a few minutes left for, uh, for some conclusionary remarks. Um, so let me just look at the, the quantum control framework uh, just beyond, you know, just us rewriting our Fortran code and getting a nicer workflow and, and talk a little bit about how this would interact with the other packages. Uh, so the thing, that one thing that's quite unique about Julia is really how multiple dispatch allows you to really separate the core algorithms from sort of the, the incidental surrounding structures, right? Uh, and we have that at, at different layers. Uh, so the implementation of the, of the optimization method is separated from the, the time propagation, so you can just define your own methods for simulating dynamics. And, and the time propagation, again, is separated from the structure of the Hamiltonian, so you can model your physical system in any way you like, right? So the only thing we impose is really the notion that there has to be something that we can identify as this is the control, because otherwise you don't have anything, you know, to do optimal control on. Um, and all of these, these different interfaces, they're, they're really fully specified, and we have a function uh, that, that checks that a given object implements that interface uh, correctly. Uh, so we would certainly like to interoperate uh, with other packages, right? So, you, so if you have modeling structures like quantum optics, uh, you should be able to use those. Or if you have special solvers, maybe for open quantum systems, uh, you should be able to wrap that in the, the propagator interface. Or if you have an implementation for other methods of quantum control, um, then you know it should be possible to make that work with the, with this optimized function and with the the way the the control problem is defined in this library. Uh, and obviously, if you're an author of one of you know a package like that, I'd uh, very much like you to get in touch. Um, right. I could, I guess, also, since it's still only 26 minutes, I could say maybe a little bit about sort of things that are planned. Um, so, so, so I talked about controls that are basically piecewise constant, and that gives you the most general, uh, the most general uh, kind of control that you could possibly have. But in practice, uh, there's also uh, a lot of value, and if you have more constrained controls in the lab, you might have controls that actually only have a few free, free parameters. As you would move from piecewise constant pulses to parameterized continuous controls, uh, and, and um, then you, you don't actually have a piecewise constant uh, propagation, but you could actually just use differential equations as a propagator. And there's also specialized uh, quantum control methods like that. So if you're you know, in the field, there's like crab or group or goat. Uh, so these, these are definitely things that should be implemented uh, at some point um, soon. But, but of course, the drawback of this is uh, you know, then if you constrain your pulses, then you end up also with local traps and controllability issues, uh, but that's just you know, something we'll deal with. Okay, and I think with this I'll, I'll stop, and uh, we still have uh, some time for a question or two.
So yeah, so thanks for the great talk. Um, I was I am mostly curious about the local traps aspect. So, so regarding global optimization, for example, I mean, there's there's a bunch of schemes out there. So, so what stops you really from doing that? Is it just that you essentially from doing like the yeah, like a few parameters? Exactly. If you have a few parameters, then you do global optimization over over them. Um, um, no, so nothing stops. I mean, it's just that. So usually, I've been interested in sort of like I give you a system, and I want to know like what is the shortest time that you can realize a gate in or something like that. So then you really don't want to put constraints onto your control. So it's sort of a different, it's more like a controllability uh, 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 mindset. Uh, if you have more of a mindset, I'm in the lab and I actually have constrained pulses, then yeah, you might want to do that, but I, you know, I just haven't gotten around to it. Basically. Okay, fair <laughs> enough, yeah. Uh, okay, wait, more questions back here. Yeah, thanks, this is awesome. Um, so like one question on like the, so you, you gotta look like a, Pretty like it converged to a solution. So that was a solution with the like not the full ex matrix exponential, but with like the Chebyshev polynomials. With the Chebyshev, yeah. How does like the fidelity with like those like how does the fidelity transfer from like the approximate to the matrix exponential to like the matrix exponential when you roll out with that? Oh, it's exact to machine precision. It's, yeah. So Chebyshev is is exact um, okay. to machine precision. Yeah. So there's no the the time evolution is completely separate from the control. You get exactly the same. Um, a solution with, with a different control, with a different propagator. Cool, so we're at time, and to give our next speaker uh, their full 30 minutes, um, we'll thank Michael again for the awesome talk. And our next speaker is Lucas DeVos, talking about symmetries in tensor networks. some time for questions maybe. So is this, is this on? Yeah, good. Hi. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Lucas. Uh, I'm a PhD student from uh, the quantum group in Ghent. And it's really nice to, to be able to present some of uh, the work we've been doing there. Um, so first off, let, let me say something about the quantum group. I mean, the website is the QR code. It should lead you there. So there's plenty of information that you can find there. But um, in short, we're actually, we are a group that are working on tensor network methods. Um, and this is like a framework that you can use to do some numerics in quantum simulations, um, and, but also uh, has led to some fundamental research uh, in, in the area. Um, and so in Ghent, we've really been, been uh, using Julia for, for a lot of the, the, the software we have been developing, of course, because of the performance, but also because of the, the way that's actually quite flexible. Uh, and so what I want to do first is actually um, give, a, give a shout out to two of the people from Ghent that really are like the, the main authors of, of most of the software that we are using there today. Um, and so the first person that I really want to, well, give a, give a big shout out to is Professor Jutro Hagerman. Um, he's actually the main author of TensorKit and Tensor Operations, which is the two packages I want to highlight today. Um, but also has been really like an active member of the community, uh, of the Julia community, and has actually um, authored multiple um, community-wide uh, packages that, that are, are used. Um, and then the second person that I, that I want to highlight is Martin van Damme. Um, he's actually here in the audience today. Um, and so what he basically did is he gave uh, us most of the tensor network uh, libraries that we are using today to run the simulations. So in some sense, he's like, uh, given all of the people from Ghent uh, the, the, the tools to run their numerics, uh, which is quite cool. And so I'll also give like a, a small uh, showcase at the very end uh, using some of, of, of this software. Um, so like without further ado, I, I will go quickly into um, the tensor network things that I want to talk about today. Uh, and so the first thing that I, I want to say is that well, whenever you are dealing with a tensor network uh, algorithm, um, I mean, one of the basic things you will first encounter 
and it's actually probably like the most important thing, is that you want to be able to evaluate a, a tensor network. Of course, that's where the name is coming from. Um, and so what the community, the tensor network community, has been adopting for, for quite a while is this di diagrammatic notation um, of specifying tensor networks. And the idea is that for every vertex, you uh, associate uh, a, a tensor or like a vector or a matrix. And then all of the edges that come out of the vertices uh, correspond to one of the indices. And so what you have over here is like a, a vector, which is just a vertex with one edge, or a matrix with two edges, and then a more general tensor, um, which has like five uh, edges. Um, and then, I mean, the powerful thing we have with, with this diagram, uh, diagrammatic notation is that if we connect these edges, what we actually mean is uh, that we want to sum over the indices. And so this is some form of like a generalized multi uh, matrix multiplication. Um, and so you can do like a basic matrix vector multiplication, but also some more gen general uh, things fit in this framework. Um, and so this is, this is definitely the, the main part of most of the tensor network algorithms you want to do. And so one of the most natural things you can ask is, OK, I have my drawings. I have my tensor networks. Well, how will I put this in my, in my code? How will I put this into Julia? How will I tell Julia how to deal with this? And so this is basically what tensor, uh, tensoroperations.gl is all about. Um, and so what the, the idea is, is that um, tensor operations provide you, provides you with a, a macro. And the macro takes in what's generally called um, Einstein summation uh, expressions. And so the idea is you, like, you draw your diagrams, you put names of the, the different tensors in there, and then you also name each of the edges. And so, of course, connecting edges means that an edge uh, has uh, like a label that appears twice in the, in the resulting expression. And then um, labels that only appear once, you, you will identify between the left and the right hand side. And so what you want your program to do is basically you want to analyze this resulting expression and parse it into uh, a series of like more basic operations that would correspond to like pairwise contraction of one of the edges or addition or maybe just like a, a trace on a single tensor. And so this is what tensor operations does for you and just to highlight what's happening behind the scenes and why you would definitely not want to be doing this manually is that this very small uh, tensor network actually expands to this, uh, this huge uh, expression. Um, and so what's really important here is that really the, the evaluation of these this, um, labels or the, like the analysis that, that really um, pairs these uh, operations up is all happening at compile time. Because it's a macro, this, uh, this, this is happening only once at compile time, and this is really quite critical because this is definitely one of the hot, uh, uh, the hot spots for performance within the tensor network um, algorithms you, you will have. Um, and so one of the things that I've recently done, done quite a bit of work on and that I'm, that I'm very excited to present to you is the fact that we uh, have announced or released version 4 last week of uh, tensor operations. And so I want to quickly glance over some of the things that we changed, added, um, and, and so one of the first things is like just a general update of our interface um, and also of the documentation. So really like do go have a look at the, the documentation. We put a lot of time and effort in there in order to make it very easy for people to, to see what's going on. Also very easy for developers to, to plug in their own tensor or array-like types. Um, and so this, this should definitely help. And then some other thing that we also like added there is, is some more um, some, a, a better interface for the allocation and the freeing of, of the temporary intermediate um, op uh, objects that can arise within these expressions. Um, and then there's actually two of the main quality of life updates that we, that we added in this new release. And so one of the things that, that we often stumble with is that because our expression is uh, parsed at, at compile time, one of the things you do not have access to is the sizes of your arrays. So um, at the point where you have the information of your labels, you don't have the information of the sizes. And then, of course, at runtime, when you have the information of the sizes, you do not have the information of the labels le left because these are all compiled away. 
And so what, what ended up happening is that we had like this very cryptic error messages, as you can see on the top, where you, well, somewhere in this expression, there is an object that doesn't fit. You are trying to contract two tensors that don't fit with each other, but you have no idea where. And this is quite a, a small uh, tensor network, so you can imagine that as the networks get bigger, this becomes very easily like a big problem. And so we added one of the things um, is like a keyword um, optional uh, runtime check for these uh, specific uh, problems where we, will, we can now enable this to debug your code and then it will tell you, ah, well, the non-matching dimension is happening at uh, label L and it will also precisely tell you what, like, what the sizes are and why, why it's erroring. Um, a second thing that, that we've added and that, well, that's already been in there, but that we've uh, kind of enhanced is the ability to optimize the, the order in which your contractions are happening. And so really this is quite a crucial thing in the sense that it can make a difference between your operation, your network um, evaluating within seconds, or if you're doing it wrong, it will evaluate in, in hours and like in worst cases, um, even days. So it's, it's quite crucial that you have the, the right uh, contraction order in there. And so what was already in tensor operations and what I want to highlight uh, again is that there's like a, a, an, an algorithm in there that will analyze your, your network and it will try to get like one of the um, optimal orderings for your contraction. Um, and so again, because this is a compile time thing, you do not actually have access to the information of the sizes. And this is, of course, quite important to determine the optimal order. Um, and so what, what was in there before is like very often you do know which ones of the indices are actually the dominating uh, ones, which ones are really big, which ones you want to scale up uh, as your algorithms uh, change. And so this is what like the top line is on there which, where you would say the red uh, connecting indices are the dominating ones. Again, if you want to actually debug this and check that you had the optimal order, you would need to insert runtime checks for this. And so again, we, we added like a an, an keyword argument that can enable like a runtime check to see if, well, given the sizes that you currently have, is this uh, contraction order you're doing actually optimal? And so um, as you can see below, the, 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 in this case, this would not be the case and it will print out a warning for you and also tell you the optimal order. So uh, an extra thing we did um, is we started, uh, we, we had actually the wish of, of being able to play around with different implementations of the, of the default um, basic operations that are in there. And so this was not really possible with the way that it was currently implemented. If you wanted to have a different implementation, you would have to wrap your array or wrap your tensor in a, in a custom type and then try to define all new methods on this. And so we kind of changed this around and left uh, like room for uh, any, any person that wants to come in and, and write their own backend to just uh, enable this through like a, another keyword argument, uh, just select the backend. And the same thing with the allocation. So if you want to experiment with like a, a custom caching for, for like your allocated tensors, then this is also something you can now do. And so, I mean, as a proof of principle, we implemented this with, for the TBLIS library, which is a, a one of the, the pre-existing um, implementations of these uh, basic tensor operations. And so in that sense, like changing the backend is as easy as just adding the, the keyword argument there. Um, and then finally, like something else I want to add here is that we also have GPU support in there. And so thanks to the, the, the Julia 1.9 work that has been going on, the tensor operations no longer needs to depend on, on CUDA for this. Uh, and we moved this to like a package uh, extension. So it's really nice to have this like loaded in uh, only when you need it. Um, and then finally, like uh, may maybe the most uh, like exciting feature for, um, for like the user, the end user is that actually because, the, because of the fact that um, the, like providing derivatives for tensor networks is, is quite easy um, in the sense that, I mean, it, there's not a lot of, of different operations going on there. Uh, we managed to write the, the chain rules for, um, for these basic operations 
all in terms of the basic operations. Um, and so what this actually means is that any, any array or any tensor type that supports what is like the, the six basic interface uh, operations we have out there will automatically benefit from the chain rules that are written there and just will work with automatic differentiation. And so um, if you just know how to evaluate your diagram, you can um, take gradients uh, however you, you like and this will all happen automatically. Um, and so I guess that leads me to the, the second part of, of this talk, and it's uh, the, the second package, again, uh, authored by Yuto. Um, and so what I want to talk a little more about now is, is actually the tensors themselves. Um, and so uh, in order to, to illustrate what I, what I want to get across is that within the tensor network uh, algorithms, you really want to be taking as much of the structure of the problem at hand uh, in, into, into your um, into your algorithms because these can really lead to, to major speed ups. And so what I mean with structure is like, uh, if, if I give like a concrete example, um, in the, you can think of a Heisenberg model, which is like a toy model for, for quantum magnetism where you have neighboring spins that are, uh, that are interacting. And so if you look at these tensors or if you look at this, this Heisenberg Hamiltonian, then you can already see that there's quite a lot of structure in there. Like the, the, there's, it's not only very sparse, it's also like the, the pattern of sparsity is, is quite distinct. And so actually what, what, what's going on here or what's happening behind the scenes is because of the fact that your interaction is rotationally invariant, these, uh, these, these tensor elements, they really are, they, they cannot just be anything they like. They have to respect the symmetry and this actually puts quite a few constraints on there. And so in order to really like illustrate what's going on here, if you would enforce the symmetry and then just see how many free param parameters you have left, then you are left with only 42. There's only 42 free parameters if you want to keep the symmetry, meaning 982 uh, parameters that are completely redundant and that you do not need to store, do not need to compute, uh, do not need to do anything with. Um, and so this is really like a, a major difference in compute time uh, clearly if you can incorporate this within the tensor network uh, algorithms. Um, and so like this is, this is what I want to convey is that you really want to be using these, these symmetries if they're there. Um, and so let me elaborate, elaborate a little bit more on actually what it means to be symmetric. Um, in, in the sense that what, the, what we're actually talking about when we're talking about symmetric things is the fact that if you have a Hilbert space you can actually like really, in, in a given symmetry, you can really like start to divide up your, your Hilbert space into different sectors that actually correspond to the different representations of, of how your transformations or how your symmetry is acting on this Hilbert space. And so what it means to be symmetric is that this is actually, th this is completely invariant. You cannot change this anymore once, once these different sectors are there. And so effectively, if you, if you would write down a linear map, there is some basis that you can write down that's completely block diagonal because, well, if you would have off diagonal blocks there, you would start mixing between these different sectors and this is not allowed by the symmetry. Um, and so this is exactly the reason why there were so many zeros in the, in the, the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. And so this is, of course, one of the things that we really wanna, wanna make use of. Um, and in fact, you can, you can do this more generally for any tensor. And what's, what you're left with is that, well, there's actually like a structural part in your, in your tensor and a data part, and the structural part is completely fixed by the symmetry. This is something that's, well, first off, invariant, and also it's, it's shared between all tensors of the same shape. Um, and so really this means you do not have to keep recomputing this all the time, and the only thing you really need to keep track of is the data, um, which contains a lot fewer parameters. Um, and then what's really nice is actually like the, the, the underlying symmetry group or like the more generalized group structures, um, the mathematics of this actually tell you how to manipulate the, the, the stru structural part. And so if you are able to keep track of how these manipulations are going on, you don't ever even need to keep the structural part, not even once. Um, and so this is what TensorKit is, is doing for you. It's basically, you forget about all of this. This is happening behind the scenes. It will do the bookkeeping for you and then just what, what you are left with is 
a package that can do the, the basic tensor operations such, such as like permutations or contractions or factorizations such as SVDs or QRs. Um, and these will like all keep track of the, the symmetric um, components uh, for you. Um, and so, well, let me just finally highlight what's already in there. So, and what's supported by, by this framework. And so, what I wanted to say is that really this is about as general as you can get it, um, in the sense that it supports abelian symmetries, it supports non-abelian symmetries, and it also supports non-abelian symmetries that has, have multiple fusion. You can also just take direct products of any of these. So this means that, of course, like the, the ones we have implemented is like the, the regular Zn or U1 symmetries, but also SU2 and more generically SUN is in there and you can take multiple copies of this and this will all work. Um, but what's more, and, and this is actually like, like going beyond the group case, is that you can also put the, the, the framework of fermionic symmetries or even like more gen general anionic symmetries in there and this is still using the exact same bookkeeping um, working out to be the, the same thing. And so what we also have in there is like uh, the Fibonacci category or the Eisen category. And if you have a look at like the category data there, you will find that like all small categories up to six elements are supported by, by TensorKit. Um, and then finally, um, I want to mention like the last one, which is even quantum group symmetries, which like, like this Q-deformed SU2, uh, for those of you that know what it is, is also supported by, by TensorKit. And so I, I guess that leaves me with like a couple more minutes to show like how this would be put into action and, and what it can actually give you to, to be able to use this. And so this is where I can tie back to like mpskit.jl, um, which is, well, the, the main tensor network library or the matrix product state library that we're using in Ghent, written uh, by Martin again. And so um, what's in there is, is basically like the, the ground states and the time evolution or like correlation functions, expe expectation values for anything that's basically 1D or quasi 1D. Um, so this would also include like honeycomb lattices on a cylinder if you, if you would like this, this is also in there. Um, and so let me, let me give you two concrete examples of this. Um, and so the first thing that I wanna, I wanna do is just tell you a little bit about the, the Hubbard model. Um, this is a, a model for spinful uh, fermions on a lattice that are, that are hopping around. And so one of the things that we know about this is that, I mean, for a generic filling factor, you can have uh, an SU2 cross U1 and fermionic symmetry in there. And so what TensorKit allows you to do is, I mean, you can enforce all of these symmetries together um, and then if you have a look at the dispersion relationship, um, you can actually plot the dispersion relation of um, all the uh, elementary excitations at half filling. And so what's predicted and what theory tells you is that there will be a separation between the charge and the spin excitations. And because of the fact that we are enforcing the symmetry, you can really target these separately. So on the left, you have the spinon excitations for different values of the parameters and we, we perfectly reproduce these. And then on the right, you have the, the holon, anti-holon dispersion relation, and, and again, we can like, quite uh, easily find the, minimum, the minima of, of, of these dispersion relations. And this is really, like, uh, and this what I wanna emphasize, is that this is really only possible if you actually are able to enforce these symmetries, because otherwise, you would never uh, be able to target this, this, uh, this way. Um, and then the second example I want to give is like a modified version of the, the Heisenberg model, um, which includes some form of anisotropy in the, in the Z direction. And so there is this parameter delta in there, which if you set it to one, will recover your, your initial Heisenberg model. And so what we know is that for delta is equal to one, this has a regular SU2 symmetry. And then as soon as you change your delta, this SU2 symmetry is no longer there and you're left with only a U1 symmetry. And because this is an, is an abelian symmetry, this will actually gain you less by, by way of like computing power. Um, but again, theory tells you that there's still some way you can put an SU2 non-abelian sym symmetry in there. And the way this is done is by doing like a Q deformation of this SU2. And so you, get, you end up with this quantum group symmetry. 
and we actually implemented this. Um, and so, like on the on the right hand side, you can see that the the, the results match up perfectly. But on the left hand side, what's actually really interesting there is that the blue dots you can see on top is what would happen with the amount of parameters, the amount of free parameters, if you don't impose any symmetry. And then, like this is about the order of 150, and um, for a given precision. And then, of course, if you if you put in the U1 symmetry, you already get to reduce this by quite a bit, and you're left with like 50 to 75 um, parameters. Uh, and then, of course, if you're still able to put in the full non-abelian SU2, albeit uh, a little deformed, then you are left with less than 25 parameters. So you go from like 175 to 25. You, all of your algorithms will run a lot faster and will converge a, a lot smoother. Um, and so that kind of leaves me with, with like uh, uh, some things to look out for in the very near future. Um, so we're currently working on both like the GPU support for this tensor kit, uh, including all of the tensors. And I can say there that like we're actually about 75% of the way there. So you can really expect this in the, in the very, very near future. Um, and the same goes for the, the automatic differentiation of the factorizations. So the, the tensor operations one is already automatically in there, as, as mentioned before. So you can do contractions and the automatic differentiation will work. But uh, the, for the factorizations, you still have to wait like a couple weeks TM. Um, and then something else that we, we, we really want to be working on is maybe like for, for a, a bit further down the, the line is we want to have like an automatic way of, of computing all of the necessary group data um, to, to really like incorporate any group you can think of uh, automatically. And then on the, on the side of tensor operations, um, because of the fact that we got to um, like really change out backends on, in a more dynamic way, uh, we want to start experimenting a little bit with this and see what like the different implementations can do for us performance wise, but also like the different allocation strategies um, can make like a, a big difference and see, see what, what's going on there. And so, I mean, I guess that, that's it. I, I like thank you a lot for, for the attention. Um, if there's any questions, um, well, you can find our information on, on GitHub and, and feel free to contact us or ask me now. Thanks very much for the great talk. Um, so are there any questions in the room? Yes, so let's start over here. Uh, there is this package, Tulio, that's uh, good for tensor contraction and uh, automating some of the compilation. What are the pros and cons of tensor operations compared to Tulio? Uh, when should I be using which one? Um, yeah, so, so I have to admit I'm, I'm not as familiar with, with Tulio as uh, I should be. Um, and so, but, but what I can say about this is that, um, so like the tensor operation thing, uh, as far as I know or as, as far as the things that I do know about Tulio, tensor operations is really focused around tensor networks. So we're, we're doing contractions and, and it's basically like the, the very basic um, um, Einstein summation things that are in there. So it will not do any of the max or, or more complicated reducing strategies that you could put in there. Um, but, but one of the things that we actually wanted to do is, is compare or are wanting to do is compare the performance of the two. Um, and so this is basically why we rewrote, we rewrote some of the interface such that we can now start um, experimenting with actually using Tulio as a, a backend for the tensor operations. Thank you. Um, so I noticed that there was a backend that was called native um, as an alternative to BLAS, because I, I guess in, in general, tensor operations is mapping to, to blast calls through tensor permutations. Um, what's the status of this native backend? Is there actually a native Julia tensor contraction? Yeah, so, so um, well, so this is actually w one of the things that, that Yuto has, has developed. So he has this package called Stridit. And so for um, 
any strided array, there is actually an implementation, a native Julia implementation that will uh, do like the, the lazy permutations. Or in other words, if you want to do a, a tensor contraction, um, you can get away with contracting these without um, doing the intermediate uh, permutation and allocating this object. Um, and so the status there is that this works and this, um, this, this is also what we're using if you would have like a, a scalar type that's not supported by BLOS. So you could do like big floats or, or whatever uh, other thing you're working on. Um, and it has some support for like even some multi-threaded um, blocking strategies that, that are in there. So, I mean, there is actually like support for this for, for strided uh, arrays. Um, so uh, what, what's the performance like? And then also, is it similar to like TBLIS? Um, so TBLIS also has the limitation of, of being um, actually restricted to, to the BLOS float uh, type numbers. So performance wise, it seems that the, the, like for larger matrices, BLOS is, is very hard to outperform, which it's, it's kind of what we expected. Uh, while for smaller, um, smaller tensor contractions, the, 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 I think the strident uh, approach is still quite, um, quite competitive. Uh, and then again, I, I mean, the, the, the most notable difference is, of course, the support for, for the, the scalar types that are different. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I'm very sorry. For in the interest of time, we have to move on to the next speaker, but we will have a coffee break coming up uh, after the next uh, talk, so there will be opportunities to ask your questions then. So, yeah, Matthew, please uh, go and set up. All right. Sounds good. All right. Um, I guess I should get started. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Matthew Fishman. I'm the uh, the develop lead developer for the iTensor library for uh, Tensor Network calculations. So this leads nicely from the previous talk. Um, we have a lot of parallel functionality to the Gent Group's uh, software suite, the, the kit, kit suite, I guess. I don't know what to, um, and I am at the Flatiron Institute in New York. So l let me just give you uh, an overview of, of iTensor. Um, so iTensor is a library for implementing and running tensor network algorithms. Um, it has a unique index system um, for performing basic tensor operations, which I'll um, briefly review. Um, and that, that index system helps to remove ambiguity and in performing tensor operations and also helps to, we hope, and we think it does help to um, more quickly implement tensor network algorithms. Um, while reducing the number of errors that are involved in that process. Um, and we have a, a flexible and efficient implementation with primarily a CPU backend, but with a um, decent GPU backend, which was started by Katie. Um, so I say decent, it's very good. It just was, uh, <laughs> well, ha has been stuck just with dense operations for a long time, and most of our users use block sparse. So. It, will, it couldn't be used as much as we would hope, um, but the dense is, is very good, and um, and de dense and block and block sparse uh, tensor support. So um, so just as a little history, iTensor was originally written in C++ starting in 2010 by um, Steve White and Miles Studenmeyer, um, and I joined the Flatiron Institute in 2018 and 
helped uh, in collaboration with Miles ported the library to Julia um, in 2019 to 2020, which was, uh, a, I think, a really good move for us. Um, it's to give you a sense of like the scale of um, how much iTensor is used. It's been used in about 730 research papers so far, which so it's it's widely used in our community. It's um, if you look at like the papers that it's used in, it's mostly used in condensed matter physics for studying the low energy properties and dynamics of um, low dimensional um, interacting quantum many body systems, and more recently has found more applications in quantum computing and machine learning, and I think we'll start branching out to new fields like quantum chemistry, differential equation solving, high dimensional integration, and there, it, it's amazing how, how many new applications there are for tensor networks these days, and we're excited to stay on top of our, the development of our library so that our library is easy to use for these new applications. Um, so, we have a, a nice website, itensor.org. We have our own discourse forum, because it just seems a little too complicated to, to use the Julia discourse. Um, and it's, it's very actively used. I can't keep up with all the questions. Miles does a better job. Um, here is our institute. We're in New York next to the Flatiron Building. Um, we're in the, I'm in the Center for Quantum Computational, um, sorry, Center for Computational Quantum Physics, um, which is a research center as part of the Flatiron Institute, which is part of the Simons Foundation, um, where we generally develop um, computational methods for quantum physics. And tensor networks are just one, one of the sets of algorithms we develop there. Um, our, our team at CCQ right now is me, Miles, who's the tensor network group leader, um, Carl Pierce, who's in the room, who is a um, software postdoc working on iTensor, uh, more on the, um, the low-level tensor operations. Um, Joey Tyndall, who's also not in the room, but, oh, no, he's back there, um, who's been working on, recently on uh, tensor network algorithms and software for um, tensor networks on general graphs and um, another postdoc, Benedict Kloss, who's not here, um, and a number of um, internal and external contributors, including Lander, who will be giving a talk later. And we're always um, looking to hire postdocs, interns, software developers, so um, reach out if you're interested. Um, so I guess we already got a bit of an introduction to Tensor Network, so I can breeze through this. But ba basically, um, just to, to get everyone on the same page about the notation, um, tensor networks are a language for describing high order tensors. So we have this diagrammatic notation where we represent a tensor by a node, and then the order of the tensor is um, determined by the number of lines coming off of that node. So you can see a vector is a node with one line, a matrix is a node with two lines, et cetera. Um, and it, it's a very elegant language for describing um, even just uh, matrix operations. Um, so for example, a vector vector inner product is two nodes connected by a line. A matrix vector operation is two nodes contracted over a line. A, a tensor contraction um, happens when the lines of two nodes are, are connected to each other. So it implies, like Einstein summation notation, it implies that you perform a sum over the the edge that's connected, um, uh, et cetera. Matrix matrix multiplication is the contraction of two uh, order two tensors, and you can represent elegantly represent um, more complicated operations like um, the trace of the the multiplication of two matrices or the outer product of vectors, um, or some something more general, and usually we'll have very complicated diagrams like the one on the bottom right. And we want software that makes it easy to, to um, implement algorithms that involve these types of more complicated tensor contractions. Um, so ba basically, tensor network algorithms in a nutshell are that we, we often find very high order tensors in our applications in quantum physics, 
And high order tensors show up in all sorts of other places um, in quantum chemistry or machine learning or differential equations or, or whatever. And depending on the application or the details of the problem, um, you, you try to find a, um, a, a low rank representation of this higher order tensor in terms of a product of lower order tensors, which hopefully are low rank. And the rank of that um, tensor network will depend on the, the problem. Um, but at least in our physics applications, we, you very often find this sort of low rank structure. Um, and our goal is basically that we would like to be able to seamlessly allow a user to choose between any of these different tensor network ansatzes um, and be able to automatically contract them, differentiate them, optimize them, whatever, on CPU and GPU. And we're not there yet, but we're hopefully going to move towards that in the years to come. Um, so l let me just give you a, a broader overview for the, the iTensor um, library structure. So at the, at the bottom layer, there's this ndtensors.jl library, which um, provides the, the basic like tensor data structures. So for example, we have dense tensors or diagonal tensors or block sparse tensors. And um, you, the, the goal is to be able to put any of these structures on any device, which um, we have, as I said, pretty good uh, support for dense tensors on um, NVIDIA GPUs. We're working on other backends right now, or Car Carl's focusing on that. For example, um, Apple GPUs through Metal, um, and, and hopefully more uh, backends as the as the backends get more developed in Julia and um, we have the time to to implement it um, and and recently we've been starting to use the the nice package extension system um, so that you can just load these packages and then then it overloads a few functions and then you can do your tensor operations on these different backends and then we have a high level tensor network uh, T tensor operation um, syntax through itensors.jl, which is mostly just like a wrapper around ND tensors, which provides a, a nicer syntax for, for implementing tensor network algorithms. And then more recently, we've been developing this itensornetworks.jl package, which is another abstraction layer on top, which defines um, like general tensor network data structures. Um, so to give you an idea for the syntax, um, say that we were interested in a tensor network diagram like the one in the top right with uh, four tensors um, contracted over some set of in, uh, edges um, or indices. So in iTensor, you first define your indices. Um, so alpha, beta, gamma, sigma. Um, and internally, we assign those indices some unique identifier. So then if if our contraction engine sees that two tensors have common indices based on this identifier, it automatically contracts over them. Um, so you would say, define your, your four tensors with the, the indices that you want, and then we overload the star operation to be a tensor contraction. So then when you do A times A star B, it detects that A and B have the common indices alpha, and then automatically contracts over them using the ND tensor library. So you can, you can see this contrast with the, the sort of tensor operations or Tulio syntax where you, you put for the contraction you want on the fly the labels that you want, and that determines which, which uh, indices get contracted over. What's the index? That, oh, sorry, that's the dimension of the, the index. Mm -hmm. So I just picked two arbitrarily. These are just saying that these are say A is an, or, or an order three tensor where each dimension is two. So like a qubit system or spin half, yeah. Um, right, so, um, so the, the, when you 
Um, I was just showing a simpler syntax to make a, a set of indices so you don't have to make a long list like that. You can use Julia's syntax for making collections. Um, and so the, the two defines the dimension of say, this cube would be a representation of like an order three tensor where each side is length two. Um, and then, um, for example, we have some support for uh, AD through zygote. So if you define a function that takes in a variety of I tensors and contracts them, you can load zygote. We have some chain rule definitions for doing derivatives. Um, and you can just um, ask for the gradient with respect to one of the, the input tensors. Um, and then, for example, you can, if you load CUDA, it'll also load our package extension and you can just use the coup function to move these I tensors to, to GPU. Um, th this is, again, recent work by uh, Carl, um, which build, builds off of the, the nice I tensor GPU library that Katie Hyatt had written while she was a postdoc at the Flatiron. Um, and the tensor contractions and operations are, are mostly done through uh, coup tensor and factorizations are, are done through um, uh, coup lapak, is that what it's called? Yeah. Um, and more recently, we've been testing out other, other GPU backends like Metal, so you can do this on Apple GPUs. And then um, to, uh, so as we heard in the, in the previous talk, um, we also support um, symmetries, symmetric tensors. Um, so far, we only have support for abelian symmetries, but we have plans to add support for non-abelian symmetries um, like in TensorKit. And basically, in order to do block sparse operations, you just change the definition of your space. So instead of the dimension being two as before to define a dense tensor, you define it in blocks. And these quantum numbers are, are symmetry sectors. Um, and then your code basically stays the same. There's a few little changes, like adding DAG for um, uh, incoming and outgoing indices or contravariant and covariant. Um, and then all, all the rest of your code stays the same. So the, basically, we want to make it easy to mix and match um, these different features, like dense and block sparse, symmetric tensors, non-symmetric tensors, running on CPU or different GPU backends, and just make it so that you only have to change like a few lines of code and you can switch between all these different choices and still be able to do high level operations like um, automatic differentiation. Um, so now I want to move um, to like, I, I talked a little bit about the left side of this diagram, this ND tensor um, and the, some of the different um, device backends we have, and now I want to move to talk a little bit about the newer part of our library, which is the iTensor networks. Um, so we've, I've been uh, developing with collaborators at um, the CCQ and elsewhere, this library, iTensor networks, um, which basically gives a, a graph interface to working with tensor networks in iTensor. Um, so again, say we're looking at this tensor network with four tensors in the top right corner, A, B, C, and D. So you can define, and you, you first define your tensors, say, for example, and then you can define an I tensor network out of these tensors. And I, I gave them string names, A, B, C, and D, um, but you could have just left those out. That those are just for you to choose. Um, and what these are internally are vertex names. So now what we've done is basically defined a graph object that stores these tensors on the nodes of that graph. Um, so for example, you can access the tensors of this, of this iTensor network through the string names you gave um, associated with the tensors. And you can take two tensors from the network and contract them together like we did before. Um, but then you can do other, other operations, um, for example, uh, compute uh, a contraction sequence for how to contract the tensors of, of this network. Um, so one of the backends, which is covered in another talk, is this uh, OM 
and some contraction orders by Jinguo. Um, we also have a, a, a contraction backend, which is very similar to the one in tensor operations, um, which finds an optimal contraction sequence, but is exponentially scaling, so it only scales to, I don't know, 10 or 20 tensors. Um, and so that you can see that the sequence it outputs um, outputs a like a tree-like structure of the the vertex names, and then you can call the contract function and use that sequence to contract the network. And it's the same; it, it runs the same code as if you did this um, this operation on the bottom, uh, starring the tensors pairwise in a certain sequence. Um, and the, this bracket on the end is just extracting a scalar from an order zero tensor. Um, and so a, a nice thing about the I tensor network structure is that it essentially has the interface of a graph from graphs.jl. So um, we've overloaded a, a variety of, of graphs.jl functions. Um, we don't have all of them, but we have a, a lot. And um, so you can, load, you can load graphs and then say, take the tensor network object and ask for like the neighbors of tensor A. And it, it tells you, okay, well the neighbors of tensor A are C, D, and B, as you can see in the top right corner. Or you can use A star to get a shortest path between two nodes in the tensor network, for example, B and C. So the, the path is, a, a shortest path is from B to A and then A to C. Um, and you can do other operations like a uh, breadth first uh, search tree. Um, yeah, so we, we found that that has been very useful for implementing more general um, algorithms because so far iTensor has been focused on um, matrix product state algorithms where it's implicitly a linear graph and we're, we've wanted to generalize to other graph types, which um, Lander and Joey will talk about um, later. And we, we found that this data structure has been really helpful for making more general tensor network algorithms um, in a generic way that is less dependent on a certain graph structure. And having all these graph operations is really helpful for, for implementing these algorithms. Um, so I, uh, I want to give a little bit of background on the technology behind, behind this iTensor network type. Um, Graphs.jl is really nice, but it by default only supports, um, only supports a, uh, a graph type with like simple vertices, which are just labeled from one to n, where n is the number of vertices. And um, I, I thought that it would be nice to have a graph structure where you could have arbitrary labels for the vertices. And there, there was a, I came across a package labeled graphs, but it looked like it wasn't really being developed much. So I actually went on a, a side adventure and made this new package named graphs.jl, um, where you can basically just wrap any graph type and then give it a list of vertex names, which could be, I, I made them strings here, but they could be anything, and the type is parameterized by the vertex type. Um, and it basically just wraps that graph you gave it and then has a dictionary mapping the vertex names you, you defined to like a linear set of vertex names that, that the simple graph type likes to use. Um, so then we've overloaded a number of, of functions, as I showed, like neighbors. Um, so here there's a path graph and the vertices are A through D and the neighbor of B is A and C. Um, I then also defined a new meta graph package, which people are probably like, why are, do we need another one? But um, I just wanted a, a simpler, I just found that the interfaces were a little bit complicated for the, cur the existing meta graph packages. So I made this new package data graphs.jl where you basically just can wrap, again, wrap any graph type. So here I'm wrapping the named graph object I made in the previous slide and promote it to a data graph. And then a data graph can just store data on the vertices and edges. So, and, and 
I don't think I've seen this in other packages. The, the main thing I wanted was this um, get index and set index notation for setting um, and getting data from the edges and vertices. So you can just um, index into the data graph by a vertex, for example, A, or an edge. You can either pass an actual edge type or a pair, which gets converted to an edge type. So pairs are, are treated specially in the, in the notation. Um, so you can put A data on vertex A and AB data on edge AB. And this iTensor network type um, that I showed in the previous slide is a subtype of, of an abstract data graph um, super type in datagraphs.jl. So then it basically inherits this type of, uh, of syntax and what the iTensor network is, is a data graph with iTensors living on the vertices and the edges are implicitly defined through the indices of the iTensors. Um, it's a little bit technical, but it's, yeah. Um, Right, so um, so sort of as a, as a future um, direction, um, as I described, we're building out this new package, iTensor Networks, um, on top of the iTensors.jl library. And, and the goal is to define a, a general set of solvers on any of these tensor network structures, so like MPS at the top, a linear graph, or a tree tensor network, or a grid graph, which is called a PEPS, um, or just general, general tensor network structures. Um, so this is the direction we're going in, and we, we wanna be able to solve any number of types of equations that are written in terms of tensor networks. So for example, I show here uh, a linear equation written in terms of a tensor network diagram on a general graph. And our goal would be to, tr to, a user could define a graph um, and then define an equation they want to solve and solve that equation using that, that graph structure. Um, and so if you can solve, if you can do that and solve linear equations or approximating the contractions of two tensor networks or eigen equations or evolution, the, this, is, this is sort of the, the dream and we could solve a, a lot of, um, we, we could solve a lot of problems. So um, th this is a, a big ongoing effort from a number of people I list uh, down here and who are Joey and again, Joey and Lander will be talking about some of this work um, later on today. So to give an idea for the types of problems we would wanna solve, um, if we had this full technology, um, there there's, really interesting new research um, showing that you can reframe even low dimensional PDEs in terms of tensor networks. Um, so there's some recent work showing that you can use tensor networks to solve uh, the Navier-Stokes equation. Um, we can use them as solvers in other more complicated um, uh, algorithms like quantum embedding algorithms. Um, we, um, there, there's recent work showing that tensor networks can be useful for doing high dimensional integration. Um, we would like to add support for general fermions and non-abelian symmetries as we heard from the tensor kit talk. Um, I'll just mention some, some other work going on um, supporting um, distributed tensor network uh, algorithms and Joey will talk about some work using general tensor networks to simulate um, quantum computers and hopefully also start doing some quantum chemistry. So, all right, I think that's my time. Yeah, thanks very much uh, for the talk. And the board is open for questions. Yep, there's two, okay. So this time I start with you. So, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you know of any support of parallelized uh, sparse tensor contractions or say matrix contractions. Because I mean, here I see if you are block sparse, you only need to parallelize the dense, so to say, 
uh, matrix multiplications which are in the, with the same quantum number, but if you have a big sparse tensor, um, I think even for a matrix, this uh, uh, format which is implemented in sparse arrays is not efficient, and you cannot parallelize it. Do you, do you mean distributed or multi-threaded or e either one? Either. Um, yeah, maybe Carl can <laughs> answer that. I, I, I think for general n-dimensional tensors, I, th I think it's just a hard problem. Um, there's this library like Taco, which I had heard about, which seems to handle pretty general sparse tensor contractions, but I think, I think basically it's pretty hard. Yeah. yeah, it's a difficult problem. I'm coming from Ed Valave's group at Virginia Tech where we worked on tiled array that does dense and sparse tensor algebra like that. So that's the goal as a direction for iTensor is after I work on the more block sparse things to Im introduce blocked distributed algorithms for dense and sparse tensors. Of, of course, the there's block sparse is very general and you can, in the limit where the blocks are one, which you, you can get limits where you have a lot of small blocks, it, it's gonna be hard to parallelize and run on GPUs. So the, I think that's just ongoing Even research CPU. that needs, needs people to try it out. So we have question, uh, we have time for one quick question and a very short answer. I have an ecosystem question. It's great that you're already following the interface that GraphsJL provides. I know that the folks, uh, the volunteers in that organization are trying to straighten out things over the last few months, uh, merge a lot of the disparate metagraph packages. Uh, so are you part of the conversation with them? Um, I, I responded to a discourse thread and I think we're gonna try to meet on Thursday. Um, after some of the graphs talks tomorrow morning. Um, yeah, I don't wanna cause more, more, more headaches there. <laughs> I just looked around and didn't see quite what I wanted. But yeah, I think it would be nice if, if I, I think may, maybe not necessarily like merging all the packages, but making a better common uh, like abstract interface for graphs. Yeah, we good. All right, so um, in the interest of time, we stop it here. Let me thank, uh, let me, let us thank the speaker again. And uh, now I have two announcements. First, we have a short coffee break, 50 minutes. Um, and the second is today for the poster session, it starts at six and it's at the fourth floor. There will be appetizers served so that all of you are fully aware. We will basically, with our buff, we will sort of go a little bit into the poster session, but we will make sure that you have time to eat and see the posters. All right, so see you in 50 minutes.
Given some observed and the marginal maximum repository um, estimation, which is a margin. So uh, the next speaker, unfortunately, can't be here in person. So we have a pre-recorded talk uh, by uh, Jin Jiu Liu, and he will talk about tensor interface JL, probabilistic inference with tensor networks. Hello, everyone. My name is Jin Guo Liu from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, Guangzhou campus. Today, I will introduce tensorinference.jl, which is a package for probabilistic inference with tensor networks. The left panel is my collaborator, Martin. The right panel is our code base on GitHub, and the QR code. To install tensor inference, you can in open a Julia IPL and type using tensor inference. This package contains the following five main features. The first four are from the UAI competition, which includes computing the probability of evidence computing the marginal probability distribution over a subset of variables, computing the maximum a posteriori post probability distribution, which means finding the most probable uh, state of a subset of unobserved of observable, given some observed evidence. And the Maxi marginal maximum a posteriori um, estimation, which is a marginalized version of MAP. It try it, it the task is to find the most probable state over a subset of variables, and while averaging out the uncertainty over the remaining ones. And finally, we have another a feature about sampling variables unbiasedly from the probability distribution. To start, we can read a model from the disk. This model is a Bayesian network, the Asia network. This network contains eight variables and eight vectors. Each variable contains uh, has a cardinality two and each verb, each factor is associated to um, multiple variables. The factor can be represented by a tensor of rank um, of rank equal to the number of variables. This is the diagrammatic representation of the Asia network, which is basically a diagnosis process. There are eight variables in total, each being either zero or one, zero for positive and one for negative. Variables are related by arrows. The arrows mean the causality relation. For example, a recent trip 
to Asia may be related to whether a patient may have tuberculosis. The first task is to compute the probability of evidence. To achieve this goal, we first convert the graphical model, the Bayesian network, to a tensor network. Well, uh, meanwhile, we specify the tensor network contraction optimizer as 3SA. We set the evidence variable 7 to 0. 7 represents whether the x-ray is uh, that which means the x-ray uh, evidence is positive we compute this the probability of this evidence with the probability function the time complexity of contracting this tensor network to evaluate the probability is determined by the contraction order. Different contraction order may have different, may correspond to different time complexity, um, which can be optimized by the contraction order optimizer uh, specified in the keyword argument. We can also compute the marginal probabilities of all single variables. And the, this can be um, computed in um, with a constant overhead. It will not scale with the number of variables. It is computed by differentiating the process of computing uh, contracting the tensor network for computing the probability. We can also compute the most probable configuration given the evidence. It will, this most probable config will also retain you a log probability. This is achieved by replacing the tensor element from the real algebra to tropical algebra. I will not go into too much detail. And the MMAP can be computed with a, uh, we need to reconstruct the model as MMAP model. Uh, it is actually a mixture of tropical tensor network and regular tensor network. We compute the, we, we uh, use the most probable config to get the uh, log probability and the configuration of the query variables. We can also sample variables unbiasedly from the probability distribution. Here we have a tensor network and we generate the 10 samples from this tensor network, the, um, which can also be achieved using the same similar strategy as back, back propagation uh, gradients. We can also backpropagate the samples. Um, here I show a benchmark with re respect to three packages. The X axis the, is the largest cluster size, which is, which ranges from zero to 20, which means uh, represents the largest tensor um, during contraction. And the y-axis is the wrong time speed up, which is a ratio between the computing time of these three packages with respect to tensor inference. Interestingly, we find our package <clears throat> have exponential speed up with respect to the problem scale characterized by the largest cluster size, which is quite um, very unreasonable because if the speed up is from the use of blast libraries, which it should be a constant speed up, but here we see an exponential speed up. It is actually related to the 
contraction optimization contraction order optimization strategy in regular graphical model uh, probabilistic inference um, programs they optimize the tree width however optimizing the true width only optimize the space complexity there is a huge gap between the space complexity and the time complexity and this can explain the exponential speed up. We developed a theoretic, a, a tropical matrix, fast matrix multiplication package um, on CPU, which achieves the theoretical optimal performance. This is, uh, this is, the, uh, I, I did this we together with Chris a lot from Julie Hub. We also develop, I'm also 